I'm happy to present this uh, this session and, and uh, only one minute to uh, explain the uh, Catedra Quais UPF is a, is a platform uh, with uh, the aims to uh, collaborate engineers and, and, and doctors uh, because uh, the uh, biomedical procedures with uh, engineering and, and medical physician is more and more uh, progress and, and, and we are very interested in this line. Just um, is, uh, now start the presentations and uh, please when, when you... Okay, thank you. So hello, we are uh, from Hanson number six and we are going to present you our work related with computer vision for medical image analysis. So uh, this is the pipeline that we are going to follow and let's start with the introduction. So just to put you in context, computer vision is a scientific discipline that aims to um, study the uh, acquisition, processing and analysis of images in order to obtain some information and perform some tasks. Like, for example, um, uh, segmentation, classification, or object detection. Since we are talking about biomedical applications, we can use computer vision for example, for the resection of a tumor from a medical image in order to plan a resection intervention, for example. So just to point out that depending on what you want to study, the most important medical imaging modalities that you can find are X-rays, CT, MRI, PET, ultrasound, among others. And the most important um, format types for medical images are NIFTY and DICOM. So moving on to computer vision concepts, uh, we have to introduce you to CNNs. Uh, convolutional neural networks are deep learning architectures uh, that are very commonly used in computer vision in order to um, train models and be able to make new predictions. And this is the typical pipeline that a computer vision application follows, where first we begin with the data acquisition where we need big enough a big enough data set with good enough images uh, in order to properly train, validate, and test our model. Then we have to choose the model architecture that perform, performs better in our task of interest. Like for example, ResNet50, it's a very commonly used uh, CNN architecture. Then when, when we have the algorithm, we have to compute the error with a loss function. And this loss function is going to be interpreted by the optimizer, and the optimizer is going to update the model parameters in order to, make, uh, to, to decrease this error and thus obtain better results and better accuracy. And moving on to the case of study, my colleague is going to start. Okay, so um, for the case study, we had actually two cases. Uh, one of them was looking at um, diagnostic pneumonia from x-rays of the chest, and the other one was uh, classifying the stages of diabetic retinopathy from um, photographs of the, of the retina. Uh, the, the typical workflow when dealing with uh, medical images is to start with, with uh, labeled image, labeled uh, as in whether the patient has, um, has pneumonia or not, or it could also be the segmentation. Has to, every pixel of the image has to be classified as part of a class. Um, usually we don't have enough data to train a model properly, so we need some techniques uh, to augment this data, and to do that you can try rotating your image, adding noise or blurring it. Um, and this was essentially create, artificially create new data for the model to learn from. Um, this augmented data is then fed to a pre-trained model like the ResNet that has been trained on like on for, for completely different task, but it has been trained on millions of images. So it has learned a lot of interesting features. Um, those features we will take, so the, the feature extraction will, extraction will be done by this pre-trained model, um, and that's, that can be finding edges on an image or shadows um, 
yeah, they, there's a lot of possible features. Uh, then we will feed those features to um, a bunch of dense layers, and these dense layers are the ones we will train to differentiate um, between the, the classes we're interested in, so the pneumonia or the stages of uh, diabetic retinal body. Um, and finally, that will give us our prediction that we will compare to the, the label of the image. Um, so our experiments, uh, we, we did exactly like this uh, with two, those two data sets we had. Um, we reached very good accuracy on differentiating pneumonia and non-pneumonia uh, patients, 92% uh, here. And on the other hand, for the, the diabetic retinal body, we did not reach anything good enough, like 44%. Um, this was typically a typical case of overfeeding because um, the model was predicting very well, 98% on the data that it had seen before during the training, but on data that it had unseen on new data, it was completely wrong. Um, so that's a typical challenge of um, of machine learning and especially in medical science where you don't have much data. Um, so other challenges are the explainability of, of um, those algorithms. Um, to How do you convince a clinician to trust this prediction? So w one way to do it when you're dealing with images is that you can superpose a mask on the original image that will show you where the the, the the model was looking to make its prediction. Uh, this is this kind of image on the left, and you see that the model was actually looking at the lungs, which is quite promising to to find pneumonia. Um, and then another one is uh, the data acquisition that you need ground truth, and this ground truth can be hard to uh, achieve, uh, especially when it comes to segmenting the images. Here we had an attempt at segmenting the spine. Um, everyone tried, and you can see on the on the right uh, that those three attempts are very different and not of the same quality. And this will totally affect the final results if the the, the segmentation is not done properly. Um, also, another problem is like the design of the study and the algorithm that might be biased towards certain populations. It might re might work for some ethnicity for ethnicities, for example, but you would not generalize to others because they haven't been included in the training data. So to, co to conclude, there, there are a lot of challenges with uh, machine learning, though it, though it works very well and it has very promising applications. Uh, you need to consider the ethics of it, um, the portability, because they are very computationally hungry and memory hungry, and not every place has the, the, the resources to implement them. And finally, you have to um, find a trade-off between those issues and the accuracy of your model. Well, thank you for listening to it, and we will answer your question later. So hi, good afternoon. We are the group presenting the hands-on three and four, and we are going to present you how we try to merge these two modalities to use the IV degeneration simulation to the spine correction surgery. Uh, here's our table of content and the topics we are going to talk about. Uh, so first, a brief introduction. As I said, we are working with two hands-on, so we had two main topics, the first one, the first one is about lumbar lordosis, or LL, that basically is a deviation of the alignment in the spinal cords that usually requires a su surgery for its correction. It's this surgery is called sagittal imbalance deformity, or SIDM. Uh, the other topic was about intervertebral disc degeneration, and normally the diagnosis and the therapy for it are not quite just, so the, um, there's a requirement of really good patient-specific models. Uh, with so much work to do, we needed to set a clear set of, of goals and topics we wanted to talk about. So we focused on the limitations and failures of the SID. Uh, some, uh, some of the factors that might intervene in it do not allow the correct correction of the, of the spine, and there's a high risk of hardware failure. So knowing this, we decided to focus our work in trying to create a biomechanical model 
to predict, prevent, and try to evaluate the failure of, the, uh, of this kind of surgeries uh, using the information that we could obtain through the IBD model. Now I will speak a little bit about the methodology we followed. Uh, first of all, as expected, we needed to gather the data and create the 3D models for both the intervertebral disc and the spines. For the intervertebral disc, we um, base our simulations in um, intervertebral discs generated by Carlos Ruiz and the landmarks that we extracted for the MRI of the patients. Uh, in, on the other hand, for the spine, we use stand-up radiologists and with different hospital softwares, the, um, like the 3D model and the image were generated. Then we needed to morph this model for them to be patient-specific or to adapt them through the surgery. So for the ABD model, using Bayesian coherent point drift that basically allows us from a point of close of nodes of a source structure, morph them to uh, the nodes in the target structure to adapt the morphologies. We use this technique to change the model of Carlos, of the intervertebral disc, to the nodes we have obtained from the MRIs of the patients. Uh, this was done through the morph function, that is a consecutive sequence of non-rigid and rigid transformations, as seen. Then for the spine, the image generated from the spine was like, it was also an a ABG model that consisted of eight vectors and eight values that define the, um, the level of morphological deformity in the spine. And here is it seen like the um, interface more created to change these kind of values to adapt the model of the spine to different morphologies to generate pre and post operative models. And then a final mesh was generated as seen. Uh, finally, we try, we um, started the biomechanical study, and for this, uh, material properties, kinematic, boundary conditions, different loadings and steps needed to be defined, both in the um, spine and the intervertebral disc, and for this we used different programs. The, for the intervertebral disc, we used Febayo, and for the spine, we used Abacus. Uh, all of this was to assess the stress in this, of the instrumentation and the biological tissue after the surgery to generate a prediction. And we wanted to test this process by the um, results obtained through the simulation in the intervertebral disc and the pressures and different stresses that we obtained. Uh, finally, a brief explanation of how we simulated the surgery. The first step was to simulate the IBD swelling. And then we uh, remove the uh, tendons and force some deformation in the model of the spine to imitate the procedures that the doctor would follow. And after this, the uh, rods and structure of the hardware in the, has to be um, like mesh with the, um, with the model of the spine. And the weight of the patient has to be applied to reproduce the loads this kind of structures would be under and to understand what really what will happen after the surgery. Uh, well, an hour now we'll explain the results and discussion. Okay, so we performed four experiments. The first one was regarding the IBD disc. Hold on. And so we, can, we had some problems with it, but at the end we managed to give you some Optim well, some good results, where we can see that the strain peak on the IBD, well, in the morphed IBD disc happens at, at, at this step, uh, 4.3 seconds. And also this kind of simulations enables us to differentiate the nucleus pulposus and the annulus frivolus through uh, the principal Lagrange strain graph versus the Y position. So the second experiment was to evaluate the two different configurations for lumbar lordosis, one at 49 degrees and another one at the 69. And we could see through the rotten screw failure, the vertebra and the annulus fibrosus stresses that whenever the surgeon overestimated the lumbar lordosis, um, the risk of failure augmented drastically. So. Um, the op and we determined that the optimal configuration was 49 degrees of lumbar lordosis. The third experiment was relating the, the, the role of a biomaterial, which we simulated uh, ty uh, titanium rods and chrome cobalt rods. And we can see here the effects on the stresses in the, well, we can see that, for example, that titanium rods have st uh, higher stresses on these three well, in the rods, the vertebra, and the annular fibrosus, whereas the 
Chrome Cobalt doesn't. So that's due the of the property that Chrome Cobalt is more stiffer, thus uh, decreasing me the mechanical complications on the lumbar lordosis. And finally, we determ uh, well we experimented on whether the weight had an an impact on the surgery, and res the result says that it does. Whenever the mass of the patient increases, the it, the, the stresses on the rods and the uh, annulus fibrosus increase as well. So we determined that the weight is a really important factor to assess and predict a rod breakage. And finally, uh, the future work is our thoughts on how to couple these two methodologies. And it would be to first upgrade the uh, patient-specific IBD model by making it a um, shape, um, statistical shape model. And with that, uh, we calculate the reaction forces um, on the swelling phase, so we can better uh, evaluate a FEM analysis of the intervention by adding this data. And finally, calculate the postoperative proximal compression stresses, so we can again come back to the uh, to the IBD model to evaluate risk of degradation and fracture, not just only um, instrumental failure. And so we propose this pipeline, and as explained, uh, an SSM IBD model to um, analyze to well analyze the swelling, create the the spine model. Finally, well next evaluate the surgery and get mechanical failure from the instrumentation and possible IVD uh, degradation. That, with that, we hope that we'll make a faster simulation and with reduced computational cost. And well, thank you everyone for listening to us and if you have some questions, we'll answer it on, well. Yeah, and if the rest of the group want to come to answer the question, so. Okay. so. Okay, good afternoon. We are hands on two and we are going to show you how important network modeling is in order to understand body behaviors such as osteoarthritis disease. Okay. What is osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis is a multifactorial degeneration disease mainly characterized by um, like bone damage and cartilage degeneration. A word focused in cartilage degeneration. Why? Because in a healthy cartilage, we can observe that there is an homeostatic equilibrium between catabolic, the molecules that degrade the cartilage, and anabolic, the ones that generate the cartilage. However, in osteoarthritic patients, we can see a disbalance of this equilibrium uh, towards more catabolic uh, molecules, causing the degeneration of the, of the joint. Uh, sorry. Moreover, the, go back, please. the network, uh, well, moreover, the, this interaction between catabolic and anabolic molecules generate a network causing like activation and inactivation interactions. So our main goal was to generate a regulatory uh, molecule network for understanding osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis disease. Here you go. Okay, so the first step of our Hanson was to build a, regu a regulatory network model. For that, we went on the literature and we, uh, we looked for the interactions between different proteases, uh, structural proteins, and, and pain-related factors. And from that data, we built a, statical, a static model, like the one you can see here. But once we got the static model, we wanted a dynamical model. For that, we used the approach uh, proposed by Mendoza and Scenarios, which uh, they used a set of differential equations to get the expression rate of each node. And from, from these uh, differential equations, we can get the steady state of the system and we use this steady state to get the baseline, the baseline of our system. 
Then, but looking at the results of the first literature-based network, we, look, uh, we realized that it was highly catabolic. So we then tuned this network with the string database. We looked in this database for general protein-protein interactions in Homo sapiens, and those interactions had to, uh, needed to have a protein score of 0.9. And as you can see, we enriched our model with more interactions, and we called the new model enriched model. But we thought that we still could optimize our network by simplifying the topology. And for that, we used a genetic, a genetic algorithm, which is a kind of algorithm that uses a Darwinian approach in the sense that it generates new networks by introducing mutations to those networks and uh, computing a, a fitness. We used 10 different fitness functions, and we generated 100 networks for each fitness function. So we ended up with 1,000 networks. And from all these networks, we had to choose the optimal one. And for that, we performed two tests. A qualitative test that means uh, comparing our network with, uh, with the literature. And a second test, which is the quantitative. This means comparing our network with uh, experimental results. For that, we used two different data sets of experimental results, one for training and one for validation. And this is to avoid overfitting. OK, let's see the results. So here in the lower image, you can see the topology pattern of the, of the network. And this, we had 29 nodes, so 29 molecules, and 133 interactions. Moreover, more interactions in one node mean it's a more important node. OK, in the upper image, you can see the, the baseline, as already uh, Danny mentioned, so the steady state of the, of the network in blue. And moreover, to check that our network worked well, work well, we stimulated with pro-inflammatory uh, um, molecules in order to see that the results were the expected ones. For the literature, as the literature of the joint was weighed in osteoarthritic patients, we agree that we are supposed to obtain more catabolic, the orange molecules, than anabolic. And here is what we can see. We can see that the blue lines in catabolic molecules are higher, and the blue ones, the anabolic ones, are low. That, uh, we agree that the literature result is good. Regarding the rich, enriched one, here we, you can see that the nodes are the same, but we have more interactions. Uh, 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 moreover, we can see that in the baseline, regarding the blue lines, uh, here, because the enriched represents a healthy cartilage, we have uh, very high levels of, of anabolic molecules, the blue ones, and very low levels, well, non levels, of the catabolic ones. And when we stimulate it with the inflammatory ones, we obtain the opposite pattern. Okay, in order to check uh, what is the optimized network, like the best optimized network that we created over the, hand, the thousand networks that we generated with the 10 different optimization fitness functions. So we computed the errors, and we can see that the one that has the highest quality performance is the AMD fitness function. And regarding the, the, the errors, is the one that has very balanced uh, like low errors, so we decided to like, we decided that the AMD fitness function is the best quali uh, um, optimization process. Inside the AMD fitness function, the network number 19 was the best over all the all the hundred networks. So just to end up, uh, the number 19 network was our optimized final network, and we plot the heat map of the optimized network and we compare it with the Enrich uh, network, and we can see that they are pretty similar, although they are not quite the same, because, of course, the optimized one has some uh, deviation error. So in conclusion, uh, on computing and understanding molecular networks can be very helpful, for example, for clinical uh, treatments, where to target in the, in the network, what molecules to target, what molecules are more important or have more weight in the, in the network. Um, drugs, anticipating the, the possible like, after secondary effects, etc. And computing, and cal um, computing the final state, state of networks is not use only useful for cartilage, but also for other networks in the body or in the, uh, in the bi biological field. So, of course, we, we had some challenges, like not missing any interaction while reading, because we had short time of reading during these hands-ons. 
or we had also traveled to pass from the steady state equations to the dynamic ones, but we finally reached the, our results and we are very happy of it. So thank you very much. We want to thank the BPH and our instructors. And well, as the cartilage has a network, like in the biomolecular molecule network, the BPH has also created a molecule network. <laughs> well, a person network. <laughs> Okay, so welcome to our presentation of the Hanson. Uh, we've been working on during this week in the VPH Summer School. And the project we've been working on is titled Stratification of Patients with Complex Phenotypes. So to make a bit of background, we have to say that it's known that in clinical uh, practices, when patients share the very similar symptoms or they are overlapped, they are usually treated equally, and they are given simple and very rigid uh, clinical guidelines. So this is a problem because this is not personalized medicine and not everyone is held equally. So what it's done is that we tried in the, what, it, what we tried in this hands-on, that it was to do patient stratification to try to identify phenogroups and to understand better the, the pathophysiology and then do a more personalized medicine. So having said that, we can go through the data set that we've uh, used during this hands-on. This was provided by a hospital clinic in Barcelona, and we had some control patients, hypertensive patients, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients and their relatives. As you can see, the data set consisted in cardiac pathology and in a cardiac pathology trial, more precisely on atrial fibrillation and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So before going through the project, we have to talk about dimensionality reduction and its importance. Dimensionality reduction is very important in the clinicals uh, because clinical data is high dimensional and heterogeneous, so it can be very challenging to understand it and interpret. Hence, it is important to do some dimensionality reduction by simplifying its representation, uh, staying with the most important information in small number of dimensions, which is easier to interpret and, and to manage. Hence, we have used uh, two principal methods to do this dimension Reduction, the first one, the principal component analysis, which is known as PCA, and the multiple kernel learning, which is known as MKL. And the main difference is that the first one is linear, while the second one is nonlinear. So before going through the results, we wanted to point out that multidisciplinarity is key in this kind of studies, since the knowledge of different disciplines, such as medicine, biology, and engineering, has to merge together to try to obtain results which are efficient for the clinical approaches. Well, as Manal has said, during this hands-on, we have worked with two dimensionality reduction algorithms that we applied to our 11 futures that has our data using MATLAB tools. So the 11 features that we, work with, that we were working with are the left ventricular flow, the temporal aligning feature, uh, tissue Doppler imaging, and different strains of the left ventricle and the left atrial. So the first step that we did was to apply PCA uh, algorithms to our different features. And in this image, you can see the patients plot with respect to 
the two first principal components of each one of the features. So by visual, you can see that in the bottom right plot, uh, the classes can be more distinguished and so the left atrial global strain, it's more discriminative. Here you can see the plot bigger and we also made a box plot to ensure that this discrimination was made. So using left atrial global strain, we tried to reconstruct from one, a single patient the original curve by using the two, three, four, five, and six uh, first principal components. And we can see that the curves are very similar between them and also with respect to the original one, which means that the two first principal components are storing the most information, the most important information of our data. So after talking PCA, we can move to multiple kernel learning. And the first step to do is to compute the different kernel similarity matrix of each one of the features. So we can observe that each one of the kernels have the same dimensions, and also that in the diagonals, the values are equal to one, as it is the similarity between the patient and himself. So then, we use these multiple kernels using the MKL algorithm to obtain this output space where we represented our patients and we also can see that the classes can be discriminated correctly. However, we use k-means clustering to observe the phenotypes that our data contain and using silhouette methods, we try to, we, we, we compute the optimal value of number of clusters, which was four. And from this, we apply Ken's means, and here you can see our clusters plot in the output space. Finally, using these clusters, we compute the mean for each one of the clusters for every uh, future. You can see here, plot all the curves, and now is where a clinician with its training could interpret the shapes and find Path, uh, pathological shapes that could uh, be useful to decide the, uh, the, proper pro the proper treatment to each patient. So to end this presentation, we just wanted to give a brief idea of what we've learned during this hands-on. We have learned to do data imputation, which was something we have not done before. Also, we have experienced with distinct dimensionality reduction techniques such as PCA and MKL. And finally, we have learned to do this interpretation from the PCA and MKL results. So we just wanted to give thanks to our instructors, uh, Pablo Miki Martí and Mireia Macias, for their job. And also we want to thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, we will be very, um, don't hesitate to ask us. Thank you. Welcome to our presentation about the hands-on seven from phenotype uh, to genotype. Uh, first of all, we want to say a bit of background about ourselves. Um, we are both uh, cell biologists and normally work in the wet, in the, um, wet lab. And um, we have not known that the terminal exists outside of the airport. Um, so to open one on our computer was already a pretty big step. And also uh, <laughs> to find some pandas, even though we like them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice experience. Yeah. So, the aim of our Hanson was to check if we could find significant associated genetic variants in our selected phenotype. And uh, for that purpose, we have been working during this week 
uh, learning how to use Python uh, language and how to open Jupyter Notebook. And uh, we follow this workflow. So first of all, we had three different data sets from the genotype, phenotype, and covariance. And the first thing that we did was to uh, define the phenotype that we want to associate. So uh, we selected then the subjects with all the information using a key to link the genotype with the phenotype and the covariance. After that, we ran a principal component analysis from our genotype, uh, for our genotype data set and uh, we use it uh, in order to adjust for our population structure, uh, our linear regression, and then use it that in the GWAS analysis. And uh, then we try to see if we could find uh, any association between the uh, genotype and the selected phenotype. As phenotype, we choose um, the Firman grade. Um, we, so Paola chose Firman grade, I choose the modic changes. We will show Paola's data uh, in this presentation. So we chose um, Firman zero as control group and Firman bigger S2 as positive group. So um, we did then a new matrix with zeros and ones um, as we did not want a multi-class but a binary for either it's Firman or not. Um, as covariance, since age can be associated with an increased Firman grace, we chose it as covariant. Um, we then looked whether the data was normally distributed with the Shapiro test, first of all, uh, since we usually do that. But with this increased sample size, um, we then did a QQ plot or a probability plot and saw that it is linear, so normal distributed. Um, we then run our statistic tests according to the table nicely provided by Roger and um, saw then that disk narrowing as well as the BMI are um, coupled to our phenotype or can be associated with our phenotype which um, is also found in literature. But of course we have more challenges so before running our GWAS uh, since all the uh, gen uh, genotype data set is anonymized, we didn't don't know the ethnicity background information of these uh, genetic variants that could definitely bias our uh, principal component analysis and also the GWAS. So, for that, in order to avoid this bias, uh, we also run a template uh, the, the data set with a con that contains all the ethnic groups, and then we overlap it with our uh, uh, PCA uh, data in order to see if it is worth it or not to exclude one of these groups and reduce somehow the variability. Uh, in this case, it was quite equally distributed, and we, we, it was not really worth it to uh, exclude one of these ethnic groups. So we did the PCR uh, analysis and then we ran the GWAS. Yeah, we ran the GWAS and then did the Manhattan plot as this is a, also a standard plot. You see on the x-axis the chromosomes are the different SNPs and on the y-axis and the p-value in a logarithmic scale. You can see like in the red, dark red bar, uh, bar that we have some hits. So those SNPs are significant. So are will be associated with our phenotype and we have some potential SNPs. Um, to further validate whether this is um, a true result, um, we then did a QQ plot from the um, experimental and the expected p-values and saw that it follows the expected distribution. Um, of course, we would then like go further and further. Um, it was a bit sad because Francesco prepared also a second part of the hands-on, but since we were really already struggling <laughs> with the first bit, we were not as fast and could not go then further to really link the, geno uh, the, the SNPs within the genes and the associated function, which would have been the next step. But anyway, we would like to thank our hands-on instructors because they really help us and they were really patient with us. So we will be uh, happy later to answer all your questions. Thank you.
All right, so we're at, I guess, the last one uh, in presentation in number, so hands-on eight. And in this uh, our workshop for hands-on, we're interested in going through the pipeline of how can we not just look at uh, how people move, but what's actually going on, in the, not just in the joint, but in the cells of the structures in the joint, and in, in this particular uh, case, what's happening in, in, uh, in the cartilage itself. So uh, this is our kind of workflow, our pipeline. Um, kind of three stages. We have, unlike the other ones, we actually have experimental data to collect and we use that information to feed into musculoskeletal model and from that output we then do some finite element modeling and then agent-based ba agent -based modeling at the end. So combining what we see visually with what's happening at joint level and then again at, uh, at the end at cellular level. So the first part is to actually collect the data. Um, this is actually a very important part. Um, not just uh, because of how it is in the workflow, but if we get bad data, we're gonna have a bad model. As they say, garbage in, garbage out. So the most important thing is to actually go through and collect good data. So we have the steps outlined here that we need to actually, within the lab system, coordinate, uh, calibrate the coordinates so we know where the individual is uh, within the lab, uh, make sure that we can actually see them using these. Um, we don't, I don't, you can't really see it on this image, but these reflective markers that capture are captured on these uh, infrared cameras. They don't measure or well, basically reflect where this individual is in space. And then here that we have on the ground here, these uh, gray squares or rectangles. Uh, these are force plates that measure the ground reaction force of the individual walking over the plate. And in this example, here we have uh, normal gait, and we took three trials of that, and we also took three trials of this individual uh, pretending to limp uh, to simulate two different types of conditions. From this data, as, as we see here and now in this example, these little white dots are the markers that we had placed on the individual, and these kind of red lines are segments connecting um, what is representative of human skeleton to, to some extent. And using this information, you can kind of see over these purple uh, rectangles at the bottom, there's arrows going upwards, these represent the ground reaction force, and we use this information of where, where this person is in space and, and relative to the, uh, well, the force plates, do we get some estimates of the different joint forces? And in this case, we're interested in the knee. And then we took the average from uh, three different normal trials and then the three limping trials that we uh, can see from, from this particular example. And th this was all done from the, uh, well, the, the in-house software from the, uh, well, the camera device. There's three different ways to do it, but in this case was uh, using the, the, the software. And then we use this information to then feed the rest of our of our modeling. Okay. Then, well, as the idea here is to well perform a multi-scale modeling, then we move to a different model, a different uh, scale here. So we jump from the uh, uh, whole body model we are well, tracking in the previous analysis. Now we move to the uh, tissue level modeling. So in this case, we perform a finer element uh, modeling of the uh, cartilage in the uh, uh, tibial plateau of the uh, knee joint. And to do that, we need, we need to uh, uh, keep the uh, consistency between the levels of, of the scales. So uh, for that, we used, of course, the, uh, in this case, the actual load the knee was experiencing now in, as inputs in our models. So on the uh, upper part, we can see, uh, well, different points we were interested in to, to analyze, to analyze uh, for the uh, normal walking. And on the bottom part, we can see then some point of interest in terms of loading of the uh, limping. So we can well, clearly uh, see that the normal gait present a higher peak, higher uh, initial peak compared to the, uh, <clears throat> to the limping part. So there are some, some differences. And another difference was the uh, the time the the limb was uh, uh, is like like pushing or touching the, touching the, the the ground, so there is another another difference. So with uh, these inputs, then we uh, move to the to the uh, actual model. So we perform here well this model I I mentioned. Uh, we receive one nice uh, mesh of the uh, articular cartilage. We there uh, define the material properties of the cartilage. Uh, we use uh, fibril reinforced uh, porous uh, 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 cartilage model, and also with the uh, property of, of swelling. So in the first 
a part of the model will leave the, will leave the, the tissue to swell until it reach an equilibrium stage. And then we perform or we apply the uh, actual uh, loading or the forces we measured in the uh, previous analysis. And after this analysis, we select some uh, one variable that was the uh, total pressure. And at some point of interest, that was the, well, the highest value we observed in, this, in these models, uh, even for walking, normal walking or the uh, limping uh, case. And then we jump to the uh, next uh, level. Okay, so the, the the final scale that we looked at is actually the uh, molecular scale, and we use an agent-based model here to describe the um, cartilage cell population and what's happening inside those cells. So these cells have um, they can be fed in the, the the pressure that they sense from the cartilage, and they actually also produce things uh, as a response to what's happening around them. So they produce more ECM proteins or uh, also um, enzymes that can degrade the, the ECM. So we looked at the effect of wo normal walking versus limping and uh, the force that is sensed by these cells and what's happening in these two conditions after we simulate um, the agent-based model. So we... Um, oh, sorry. Wait. <laughs> Uh, we also adjusted the oxygen glucose uh, these cells received based on the condition that they experienced. So we assume that uh, with limping, the cells would get less oxygen, less glucose, and would have a lower pH. Uh, so we adjusted these parameters, and we also adjusted the frequency of the force that they receive depending on walking versus um, limping uh, observations from the first day, actually, so the, from the... The, the movement analysis. And then we run the simulations to have a four hour uh, period of force experiencing in walking versus limping cells. And then we compare the results. But then we also use the these type of equations. So uh, ordinary differential equations uh, of the type Mendoza and scenarios, which was described from, by the previous group. So I'm not going to go into details about this. But then we look at the results. So we Generally speaking, we saw that um, cartilage cells, uh, which were experienced in a limping-styled walk, they showed a, a catabolic shift. And what do I mean by that? So we observed that, so this plot is like, the baseline is normal walking, so it's our gold standard. And what you see above the zero line, it's actually upregulated in limping condition. And what you see, uh, the downwards bars are like down-regulated in limping conditions. So what are up-regulated ones? It's the um, MMP and ADAMS, uh, which are actually enzymes degrading car the cartilage uh, ECM. And mostly the down-regulated ones are the actual um, ECM proteins, so collagen 2 and aggregants, uh, which, are, um, which are found in a healthy cartilage ECM. So we observed then a, a catabolic shift in the limping case, but of course it's difficult to like conclude that this cartilage would be um, dramatically affected by just four hours of walking. So it's I would be careful to like interpret this as as a serious uh, disease or something. It's just an information we gathered from a limping case and compared to the walking, but of course it's difficult to say after just like a. Uh, for hours of walking, this cartilage would be damaged terribly. It's just be careful. <laughs> yeah, so to kind of conclude, when we think about this entire workflow in general, uh, there's a lot of potential for this method to be able to look inside the cells of the joint and maybe give us some information about how we can maybe halt the progress or even prevent uh, well, uh, osteoarthritis or any sort of cartilage de degeneration. Thank you for paying attention.
mean uh, we, combining no. the three types of models? No, just just the picture. You know, you, you're doing a project and I'm trying to compare it to the other exercises. And it felt on the surface like you were you were going for some big goals. Uh, well, was there a lot of disagreement or, or debate at the beginning? Well, if I if I understood the correctly, well, I think we didn't choose the workflow itself. It was already set up for us. Okay. So we were just following the pipeline. Okay, that's, yeah. that's, that's the answer. Yeah. Good yeah. <laughs> um, but if you want to criticize, if you would, to, if you would criticize it, oh. yeah, what would you criticize? I think Put a bit pressure on the instructions. <laughs> 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 Do you mean the pipeline yeah, itself? Yeah, the pipeline, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I don't want to answer on behalf of everybody, but I think that there's not really a different way to do it because you need to, like I mentioned, actually capture the data and then if you want to acquire what's happening at joint level, like with the forces, you have to follow that pipeline and then doing muscle skeletal modeling and finite element modeling to get even more specific measures. And then if you want to look at the cellular level itself, then you have to then continue again into the next, next phase. So there's not really any different way that you could change things or rearrange things or... Um, but that's just I think what we would change was not the, the, the structure, like the pipeline itself, but I think we would go, we would like to go more into details in our like model definitions and so on. But of course, well, I mean, it's just a four days project, so yeah. we can't really optimize it. Um, but I think what we discussed yesterday was like, if we had, um, so we had a lot of assumptions building the finite element model and so on. So we would go like deeper in, in that uh, aspect. somebody was following on from you or somebody was going to invest in what you were doing, they want you to be a little bit more concrete about, you know, because they, they can't all be equal value proposition. Can I take the answer? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Because I think it goes, it goes, systems biology goes a little bit hand by hand by systems pharmacology. So I would say the first thing, it, it gives you an idea of what kind of treatment you can go I'm after. Oh. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So what I was saying is that I think systems biology and systems pharmacology are pretty connected. So I think this kind of approach would first indicate what happens on the disc, so it would definitely help a physician try and understand what would be the first way to treat a condition. Let's say you might have a lot of MMPs, or you're like, okay, maybe I can, for example, put some TIMS, some inhibitors for the enzymes, or you might have a lot of degradation on of a lot of, uh, let's say you have a lot of infl anti -infl inflammatory cytokines, so you might go towards more anti-inflammatory medication. So it would definitely pinpoint a certain direction towards to what kind of approach could be. Maybe you could have prioritize, say, okay, Maybe we could use anti-inflammatory in the beginning. Maybe we would go for antioxidants at the second. Maybe we could go to some novel treatments at the second, third approach. And then I would definitely say if you have some new hit, you can have a new biomarker that could help in the diagnosis, prognosis, maybe in the treatment as well. And maybe you could also do some trisymptomics. Let's say you find different enzymes as well. Try different inhibitors. So I would say maybe, yeah, 
uh, to prioritize it, sorry, not make it wide, yeah. Prioritize what kind of treatment would be the best. Maybe a biomarker second. Drugs. Um, yeah, and if all this fails, then maybe something even more new, maybe more experimental data. Yeah, more doctors, I would say, because one physician cannot say it could be his decision, and then maybe some more physicians could also chip in and say, okay, we can also do this, that. Yeah, that's how I would think about it. Okay, so we, we can we can just use this one for uh, for talking points. No. Yeah. I mean it's 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 you know it's not an easy answer to give. I just thought I would introduce it to see what you know to see what answer you could think of. You know, there's there's other factors. You know, there's there's the risk of doing one thing over another, and and you know you may not, you may not be the people to do that prioritization, which is which is fair enough. Yeah. But. I'm a little bit biased, but I would always choose transymptomic data as well, just to see what's going on inside the cell as well. Because you can have a lot of data outside the cell, but then you can have one hit inside the cell and that's it. it uh, are, just, you, yeah. are you speaking for the group or just yourself? Just for me. Just for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being the bully of the group. Now. <laughs> I think you have to also like study like the market like where you want to do the investigation because maybe in some countries or some parts of the world there is more of a field investigated already so you can focus your main priority in another like Ex topic. Exactly. So There's another another factor, yeah, buying your decisions. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Shoot. <laughs> so the, the question is, um, how did you decide at the very beginning of the project, how did you allocate the tasks to one another? Did, did you have a leader? Did you, um, how did you decide to, to separate the work? Um, it's not at all a technical question. Could, could you refrain the, 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 the question, please? Yeah. What I'm asking is, when you sat for the first morning in front of your um, work to be done, how did you uh, decide between the whole, the, all the members of the group who would be doing what, who would be leader, who would be presenting, uh, etc.? Uh, well, actually, it was the way we were guided by the teacher and the hands-on was more like everybody did try to do everything, try to understand the simulation, try to produce the work of the teachers, and then we just tried to put it together and prepare the work for the presentation, but everybody did a bit of everything. Well, just um, whenever, uh, well, we reparted arbitrarily the experiments, like we... Yeah evaluated each of one of us different IBD, IBD models. And for the um, spinal experiments, well, uh, I did, for example, the, the chrome versus titanium, whereas yeah, the other colleagues did the rest, so yes, arbitrarily. Some of them had the uh, 49 degree case, the other the 69 case, and everybody got to do the same, but for different cases. Okay. Now I was wondering whether you elected immediately to have a project manager who would lead the, the group and 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 uh, decide for to to give some organization to your group in order to be more efficient. That was all. Mm, well, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just that the well, to presenting part. Well, yeah. Anais and I were really Anais. eager to. Get it. <laughs> Thank you guys. So let's move to the next uh, to the next point.
You, you don't have your uh, presentation in front of you, but when I remember the goals at the start of the presentation, those were some big goals. Were you given those goals or did you decide them yourselves? The, the goals you had on your first slide, you know, what you were looking to achieve, uh, from what I gather, it's quite a short exercise that you were doing. Those were some, those were some big goals to be going after, some big objectives. Were you given those objectives, or did you decide them yourselves? Yeah, we have a, we, the, the instructors give us a guidelines okay. with, with the objectives, and we, we follow them. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you, would, you would have to receive these objectives after, so after your so experience. So, in which case would you apply this kind of complex certification? Well, this can be useful for every data that has a lot of futures and that you need a production dimensionality to to deal with it. So, I don't know, uh, maybe breast cancer or every disease that can have a lot of data and that it's dif difficult to manage. So, using this dimensionality reduction, you could manage better. I think. Well, I'm talking by me, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thanks. thanks, guys. Okay. So, from the it looks a bit like So, um, on, on your group, I was wondering whether you had uh, contacted an ophthalmologist after you got your data in order to discuss them and, and to interpret the data on the basis of a real physician, uh, of an, the opinion of a real physician. Yeah, so uh, we didn't have an, uh, a discussion with a clinician as such, but we did do some, for example, some segmentation exercises, and like the ground root for our algorithms was based on yeah somebody with more experience, let's say, who did the segmentation themselves, like a clinician would would do it, or a physiotherapist, or somebody in the medical world, and then we kind of tried to do it ourselves and to see uh, how much experience is actually needed to do such a good. Ex um, segmentations have good ground truth. So normally the when you build these kind of algorithms, you want to trade them and what you're training on um, called the ground truth. These images are usually processed by some clinician in some phase. Clinician or radiologist, I made mistake. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but we didn't have a direct contact with a clinician. Thank you. Uh, the results from uh, pneumonia and the, the ice analysis are very different. Uh, if you would start uh, again, would you choose uh, instead of the eye another part, or you would make the things differently to, to be sure that you are able to get the results on the part? Um, I, I don't think we, we're not giving up on people with diabetic retinopathy because we failed here. Is that <laughs> we, you mean for the hands on? We, we, would we try with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I different mean, case. Yeah, the fact. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So as as the, you get the great results in one case and the bad results in the other, what would you do? Well, I I think it's actually interesting to have uh, bad results sometimes, and in this case, um, because it it could tell us, well, if we manage, we, which we didn't have time, to find why did it fail, 
uh, because the data set was decently big. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to know why. And for example, I know that in the case of uh, classifying retina images, um, you always try to, not always, but often try to just segment the blood vessels to help the, the, the model um, learning features. And um, so, it, so it's interesting to see that if segmenting those blood vessels increase the accuracy, that means that the blood vessels have a lot to do with the disease. Um, so that could be one of the input from failure of the output of the failure. Can, can I okay, just yeah. add on to that maybe? Um, like we had two different cases, but the one where, um, so the one case with the pneumonia, we actually had like the algorithm was supposed to say yes or no with this person and has either pneumonia or not. But with the second case, we actually wanted the algorithm to classify it in five different classifications. So that's kind of harder to do. So that means if we want to really improve that algorithm, we would need, for example, much better a data set of images to improve it. So it's not that the issue might not be necessarily the application itself. There could be under like underlying causes as to why uh, why that application was not having a very good fit. Guys, can I ask you a quick question, which is relevant to all the presentations? What made you pick accuracy as a metric for for that particular case? Um, accuracy. So it's uh, accuracy is typically the, the like a ratio of how many images did we classify wrong? How many like true positives, false positives, false yeah. negatives? Yeah, and that's just that's a typical uh, score. But then I know I know there are different ones. We d we didn't explore that because we were a little short on time. But uh, no, it's you know. it's it's a really really you know that's a totally fair answer. It's an answer I would give you know maybe ten years ago. But the thing to think about, and you're all you're all in you know these are all healthcare studies. And the things, the thing to focus on when you, when you have a healthcare situation, is risk, and it's the error that becomes more important rather than what you're getting right. So, false positives and false negatives, never, very rarely have the same risk level. In your case, you know you can have 92% accurate, but if, if all of your failures are false positives, you know you'll go well. That's okay because there'll be another test and another test. And if the person doesn't have, you know, the, the, the bad thing, you can have 99% accuracy, but if your 1% is false negative, you know, so it's just something to bear in mind whenever you're doing metrics from now on, which is to, to Emmanuel's point, you want to have a domain expert in the team as early as possible, or at least a connection to the main expert, and, and be prepared to change your metrics as you move forward. It's not it's not a metrics race, <laughs> okay? But just bear in mind that you know results have context. Okay, that's a good point, uh, Rodolfo. Thanks. So uh, last question then for the last group. Thank you, guys. Yes, so we, yeah, we, I mean, we all had it like for once in, in like back in, in uni, but then we focused both like on going to the wet lab. So we are part of the disc for all project. Yeah. And so we are kind of the ones that feed, <laughs> data. feed the system uh, with our um, biological data. And so, yes, for us, it was pretty new and pretty nice to see because like Jorge mm -hmm. and Francesco are also part of this project. And so to really see how our data or how data then gets like processed further into this 
full network. So how did how did it feel to be on the other side? Well, I know where I belong. <laughs> 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 Well, I, I do know where I belong. Um, I do like wet lab a lot. Um, I get frustrated if something does not work on my computer. And um, I mean, it was a nice experience, I must say. I mean, I like also to see what is possible. And I think also with the great talks in the morning to see how far this all has come and, and what's also possible. That even we can use these kind of methodologies to apply in our data because of course, we are not used to it to have like tons of data, like maybe in, with the genotype variants. But mm -hmm. it is true that sometimes we gather also more data, and it's uh, really useful for analyzing that it and it could really help us, I think. Mm -hmm. And it was nice to see also the difference between usually we have like sample sizes of like in, in biology you go like for three donors because it's not possible to do like two hundred replicates right so yeah. we go for like three to five donors and then like they explain us that yeah but if, if you then do like the normalization or if you look if it's parametric or non-parametric it gives you like a, a wrong result in that sense and then you have to go to the qq plot which is like you see that it's normally distributed and i did not it's yeah. like the statistic yeah. change <laughs> totally yeah i had a quick gdpr question for you did you ask permission from the guys before you put their photograph up <laughs> And I am only joking. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. So what I propose, because uh, we're a bit behind of schedule and coffee break is already served, so maybe we can uh, leave the jury uh, talking quietly about the hands-on. We can go out, have a coffee, and then we come back for the we come back for the results. Okay, so let's come back let's come back at four and we'll start the roundtable five minutes late. That's fine. great. Uh, I think the poster sessions have been very active and, and the posters were all of very high quality and that's great to see, to have seen so much discussion in front of the posters. So not only with senior researchers but also among uh, early stage researchers, even with bachelor students and it's, it's real, it was really a, a great uh, intergenerational and interdisciplinary integration. So it's quite unique, and, and thank you all for that. And thank you also for, for the quality of the poster. So uh, we, had, um, we had more than 10 reviewers uh, that during all the week came to the posters, asked you questions, so you didn't, know, you didn't know whether they were reviewers or not. And they assessed so every poster according to the originality of the, wor of the work, the quality of the, of the methodology, the possible impact of the results. Uh, each poster.
had uh, received three independent, uh, three independent reviews, and then all the independent reviews were made together. Um, there was no necessity of the ambiguations. The scores were very clear. And uh, we have a winner. And the winner is Sofia Tseranidou. for her work, Nucleus Pulposus Cell Network Modeling in Early Intervertebral de Degeneration. Sophia, you're here. Uh, so I would like to disclose that uh, the awards are for, are for everyone. So actually the criteria of selection of the awards and the reviewers were so instructed that uh, it shouldn't depend on seniority. So the way uh, the research has been communicated uh, during the posters was, was very, very important. So now uh, we come to the QS UPF Best Hands-On Award. So maybe I will let Edward to announce the winner. Edward, do you want to do that? So the winner is not Eric Topol. <laughs> Eric Topol is a present. <laughs> Thank you. It's very difficult to, to, to decide because the, the level was very, very high and, and, and especially um, the, the, the works uh, um, uh, done in such a uh, short, uh, short time and, and, and it's, it's uh, congratulations to, to all presenters, all presentations and all speakers. But the, the winner uh, are all, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sorry, but but only one one winner is is a hands-on three-four spine and intervertebral dismodeling. Congratulations, guys! Yeah, yeah, come on.
So we'll start the round table now. Uh, I think if you want, well, Yeah. So we know we know start with the round table. Just wanted to have the okay from the technicians because there are people connected on Zoom. Sorry, there are some Zoom manipulations so that people who are online can, can hear correctly. Okay, yeah, just switch back to my computer just for the introduction, and then. <coughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so welcome to this. Welcome to this. Uh, so uh, QIS uh, UPF uh, roundtable. So it's called Good Practices in Ethics and in Silico uh, Medicine and E-Health. Uh, why? Uh, why have we decided to, to do this roundtable? So uh, EIT Health. I don't know if you know EIT Health, but this is this is a major uh, European consortium that promotes the technology transfer. Uh, the, the transfer of uh, healthcare technology to the society. Uh, so has a working group working on uh, inter artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence uh, can transform the healthcare and the working force uh, worldwide. And uh, we'll not specifically talk about AI here, but about in silico medicine in general and in silico technologies in general. But I think the reflections are much more advanced in the domain of AI for uh, obvious reasons. 
Uh, so there are very interesting things to pick up here, and, and that can be applied to the in silico spectrum. So uh, first of all, there is uh, the analysis of uh, the segmentation of the application sectors. So there is chronic care management, self-care prevention, wellness, triage and diagnostic, diagnostics, uh, clinical decision support, uh, care, care delivery. So I really recommend you, if you're interested, to uh, read this report that has been co-produced by uh, EIT Health and McKinsey. It's, it's really instructive. So, and if you read this report, and uh, for any of these sectors, you can ask certain questions that are related to ethical, uh, to ethical aspects. Uh, the most obvious one and, and linked to technology is how to ensure that models can properly anticipate evidences. So during this summer school, we had uh, <coughs> very nice presentations that already highlighted the importance to define a purpose, specific context of use, then to have a, a proper, to do a proper exercise of verification, uh, consistency of the models, and validation. We'll not discuss uh, how a validation should be exactly implemented because there are certainly a lot of nuances, uh, a lot of nuances that will depend on the technology and, and the degree of complexity of, uh, of a model. But, but certainly uh, there is direct validation, indirect validation, and all should be validation so to ensure a proper anticipation of evidences according to specific purpose and context of use. Then, uh, and I put an example here, so I don't know if you know this series, and I'm doing a bit of, of advertisement here, that's Dopesick. That's uh, the story of a drug in the US which was uh, an anti-pain uh, drug, an analgesic based on opioids, and a um, pharmaceutical company was claiming that uh, it, was, it was not generating addiction. And it's based on a true story, actually. Uh, and they got FDA approval, they got the label that uh, it was not generating addiction. And one of the key documents they had to get this, appro this approval was a document that was showing a delayed release of the drug because of how uh, it, was, it, it was wrapped in the pills and uh, that the, the level of drug released in the body so would never reach uh, a certain level. And they had represented that graphic on a logarithmic scale. And the representation of a logar on, the, on the logarithmic scale showed clearly that, yeah, there was no drug addiction. If you would put it in a normal scale, then the interpretation would be completely different. And this drug has killed um, many, many, many people during many years, and, and they had a lot of struggles, actually, to force or, or to convince the FDA uh, to change the label and uh, in order to protect the population. So we're just talking about a curve uh, on a sheet of paper either in a scale that is logarithmic or not logarithmic. This is, a this is a representation. This is probably the most basic definition of what a model is. So this is, this, is, this is a very simple example to show you that we don't need to go into complex computer models in order to uh, see possible pitfalls of, uh, of modeling and uh, verification and validation. Then, uh, how to ensure model and simulation related software standardization and certification. Uh, if I'm going to a clinic that is using a certain model to predict my health, I, I, I don't want to have a different prediction if I'm going in another clinic. Well, I don't, have, don't want to have another prediction if, uh, the, if the hospital uh, to which I'm going is uh, changing the software provider. Uh, then, how to ensure that the use of models won't create exclusion, discrimination. So, I, I have put an example, this is another movie, uh, I love science fiction, and uh, which is Welcome to, Gata to Gataka. It's, it's not a new movie, it's, uh, I think it's from the 90s. Um, so, here they basically have artificial intelligence algorithms that analyze your DNA, and they, they classify you, they classify the population in terms of persons at risk to have uh, certain responsibilities of the population. So they basically then define who will be the alphas and who will be the betas and who will be the deltas of the society. And once you're classified according to 
one here or a, a drop of God uh, of uh, blood. Sorry, uh, uh, there's nothing you can there's nothing you can do to evolve in uh, in the in the society. Uh, this is science fiction, uh, but very recently we knew uh, another example, which is uh, extremely basic. Huh? All these digital certificates for COVID. So there were a lot of uh, elders who even didn't have a, a, a smartphone. Huh? They are still with the old Nokia that you unfold. And uh, so, so these people were basically put at the margin of the society or were made completely dependent on having possibly families or friends able to, to handle properly the technologies. Uh, so no need to go into science fiction to so already see, see examples. Uh, how to ensure that uh, the wide use of models won't create unwanted behavior in the population? So if you see uh, the compulsive behavior that uh, only a like button uh, can generate on, on, on platforms such as uh, Facebook and, and Twitter. So imagine the type of behavior uh, that an app where you can constantly monitor your constants and, uh, and this constants are constantly related with, I don't know, uh, when you will die, you know? Oh, today, great, I have slept well, I have one half an hour of life. <sighs> Tomorrow it will be two hours, no? And uh, is it desirable to do to, to, to have this kind of, uh, of application? Uh, it might drive people really, really, really crazy. So this is, this is another aspect, no? exacerbated hypochondria, uh, uh, prediction addiction, compulsive behaviors. So there are many, there are many questions uh, around uh, ethicals for digital health. And uh, in this roundtable, so I, I'm, I'm very happy that we have been able to gather uh, several uh, experts. So we'll articulate a debate uh, around following points, so current standards for model safety, artificial intelligence data, software certification, proper use of simulation technologies in health, so recommendations, uh, empowerment of patients, citizens, then looking to the future, health predictions, preventions, possible ethical pitfalls of short-term, long-term predictions and uh, access to proper technology, education, and, and, and inequalities. So um, to start with, uh, Jose Manuel uh, Santa Barbara, who is representing the QS uh, from Foundation, will give some <coughs> introductory uh, words. And uh, then so we will have uh, our different uh, actors of the, of the roundtable. Marco Viceconti, Luca Emili, Gordon Johnston, Giuseppe Verges, and Alessandro Blasime, uh, <coughs> who will uh, be given the word and uh, will uh, and uh, will present uh, their experience and interact so under uh, professional chairing of uh, Marta, who is here, Marta Pulido, and I will give you the word in in, in few seconds. So I will so. Uh, let you introduce properly all the speakers, and uh, in order to to guide the debate around uh, the different points uh, I have highlighted, and of course that's a complex system. We have many agents interacting together, so uh, we're really expecting so to see emergence ideas and considerations uh, coming out of that. So that's it. Roundtable is open. Uh, so maybe now we can switch to Zoom. And Marta, from now on, I leave you chair the session. Maybe we give the word to uh, Jose Manuel Santa Barbara first, and but he will be on Zoom, so we need to switch the screen. And uh, yes, and then. Okay, so I, I was uh, presenting our, our foundation that uh, I have to, to move uh, uh, fastly to end the, our presentation because uh, there is a big delay and, and I think the important is, is, is to come. So uh, I would like to justify our, uh, our support for this event as the, the theme of the, or that event affects us more and more every day. 
and in a very positive way. For this, I would like to, to explain our numbers. For example, uh, in our foundation, we are working in more than uh, 600 clinical trials, in, uh, in vivo clinical, uh, in vivo uh, clinical trials. But we are starting uh, nowadays uh, more than 20 in silico studies. And after a big effort working in the perception of patient about clinical research, we are starting. We are starting one new challenge, helping patients to understand and participate in silico, trial, in silico trials, explaining them that it will be the digital twin composed by their images, their medical records, etc., who will participate in this, in, this, in this research. But we are also starting to participate fully in ongoing projects or study based in a silicon for which we need uh, for this for this purposes an, an enormous uh, quantity of data. This kind of, uh, can be prospective or retrospective. When we, the, the collection of data is, is prospective, there is no problem because we find them very similar to in, in vivo trials. But the, pro, uh, the problem for us and where is a uh, big gray areas is uh, we want when we need or we want to use retrospective uh, data. I'm sure the next, uh, uh, people talking today will clarify this point, I'm sure. For all, that, the, all these reasons, even that we understand that it's a still a great challenge, uh, we want to, to share our, our point of view and learn from the experts that uh, today are invited. And it is, it, that's all, and thank you for, for this opportunity. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, yes. uh, thank you, Jose Manuel, and thank you, the audience, for your patience. Uh, we are sorry for this uh, inconvenience, although we have to confess that we are so much in, in, into in silico medicine that we were just trying some kind of multiverse. <laughs> so that's the reason that we were hearing so many Jeromes and Jose Manuel. <laughs> and well, just to continue with this interesting topic, and because I know that this has been a very busy week and that you are, a, well, <laughs> maybe some, uh, you want some drinks after all. I will explain how this dynamic will go. We will have the first part of the session that our standing speakers that they are coming from public institutions, private companies, and also from patient representation, they will explain um, they know how and expertise in silicon digital health medicine. And later on, we will discuss uh, more topics. And I encourage you to participate also in the discussion of the round table. So, next speaker is Josep Vergés, who is the president and CEO of the Osteoarthritis Foundation International, an independent nonprofit foundation that it's aimed to promote scientific research in the field of osteoarthritis to improve the quality of life of the patients and people who suffer this condition. So, Josep, the floor is yours for five minutes. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to, to thank to the organizers, uh, you know, in the University of Pompeu Fabra, that is a very prestigious university. Uh, and also, I'm very happy that the patients could be participate, you know, in this round table, you know. Well, I would present myself. Um, I am a patient, but I am, at the same time, I am a medical doctor, no? And uh, we represent uh, approximately in Spain 7 million of patients with OA, and also with osteoarthritis. Mm? And at the same time, I am the president also the, from the Woman Patient Society uh, in Osteoporosis. That means that more or less we represent 10 million. The Osteoarthritis Foundation International, uh, we are leading in the world the, the, the problem of osteoarthritis with the Artitis Foundation in the United States, uh, we create the task force and we more or less, we have 400 million people that we are working together internationally. Uh, well, the statistics is, uh, you know, a very important disease. Uh, according with the Lancet Commission that we participate, there are approximately 500 million of people in the world affected with uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, you know, in the last 20 years, the, it was a lot of people and we represent patients that uh, they have way. Also, women, not forget it, that the statistic 
problem is a gender disease. Eh? This is very important. Eh? And also we represent patients also that they have osteoarthritis because they are doing bad the sports. The sports is another problem in osteoarthritis, especially from the high-level competition. No? Uh, we, we create the foundation because, uh, you know, even is a lot of people that have osteoarthritis, I always say that osteoarthritis is not a glamour disease, okay? Sometimes you go to the doctor, and the doctor tells you, well, it's the age, nothing to do it, you know? And this is a mistake. Huh? This is the mythos of OE. Huh? There's a lot of things that must be done, and I think uh, that's the reason that we create the, the WAFI to help to the patients, no? Uh, we, have, we are very active. Uh, we are doing our Congress in Barcelona, the International Congress in Madrid. We are working in Madrid also in sport medicine because it's a source of problems. And also we are working especially with women because I can tell you some data that more or less 23% of the women than for more than 15 years has osteoarthritis. Repeat, 23% of women than more than 15 years has osteoarthritis. Okay? we see a young woman eh, with osteoarthritis eh, because there is some problems of the morphotype, genetic problems, and also sports high-level competition. And also it's another important issue with women because in the menopause uh, time, it grows a lot. Eh? That means that there is a lot of uh, women that they have OA. The same with osteoporosis, okay? That means that this is a very important disease. Normally, uh, it's a lot of research is made in, uh, in cancer, in cardiovascular, but not too much in the field, you know, of, of the palatomuscular system. I think this is a very important issue. Don't forget that the, the children that today they, they born in Barcelona, they will, if the COVID helps, they will arrive to 100 years old. No? That means that I can tell you that Spain is the geriatric country in the Europe and the second in the world. Okay, because, uh, you know, it's a lot of people coming around the Europe to live in Spain, Barcelona, uh, in Cadiz, in Menorca, in Ibiza, you know. It's a lot of people. That is very important. You should take in mind. And the quality of life for patients with osteoarthritis is uh, very bad. Uh, worse than oncologist patients because they have pain, they have depression, anxiety, they cannot sleep during the night, they have cardiovascular comorbidities, etc., no? But only the WAFI, in order to, uh, you know, to not be longer, we are doing a lot of activities in clinical trials, working with health authorities. We are very active. We are the first to have a program, TV program, radio TV program with patients who have more or less 40 million of, or millions of visions per year. Uh, that means we are doing a lot of activities to write to the patients. And, you know, you are making research, and I will tell you that patients are very important to be involved in the beginning, not in the clinical trial, in the beginning of the idea, my advice, if you like to have some project in OA, on osteoporosis, in, in sarcopenia, please, in the first idea, check it with the patients, not to wait in the end of the trials, because it's a mistake. Sometimes I can give you some examples that there is some drug, uh, you know, that arrive and patients, they don't like it. For example, I can make one example. Do you know that the patients with weight, the color of the pill, that they like it? Never ask to the patients, what is the color of the pill? We make, we make a survey and they like blue and green. That means if you go with a red color, probably they would not take it. This is, it's interesting to know that. What is the, exactly the patients they like, you know? And this is very important. Sometimes, we don't take care about that. I think it's very important. I can explain a lot of examples, no? Uh, well, I think it would be nice to discuss about this topic, no? And I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much, and, and we'll be discussed uh, later. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Josep. Well, now you know. Color is important, and it's also too important to be in mind patients and collaborate with them, not just at the end of the process, but also to the beginning. And so, next move to the next speaker, Marco. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, Marco. <laughs> well, Hi, everyone. I will present you. Marco is a full professor of computational biomechanics at the University of Bologna, 
and founder of the BPH. Marco is one of the key figures in in silico medicine, so please listen to him carefully. Marco, whenever you want, we're excited to learn from you for the next 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, the topic I'm going to focus in this brief introduction is uh, the situation of silico medicine around the use of modeling and simulation for the development of new drugs. Why? Because this is a particularly complicated scenario right now. I will try to describe this in the few min next few minutes. So the fundamental question is, can we predict life? Can we use a computer model, a mathematical model to predict what has happening around the health of an individual? If you ask to someone like Giovanni Borrelli, who was one of the founders of what today we would call biomechanics, his answer was, would probably be yes, because at that time, it was quite natural to see um, to investigate the human body on the whatever low physics were available at, at that time. But eventually, uh, the, we consume a divergence between physics on one side that focus on inanimated objects and a biology that uh, focused on living organisms. Um, things started to change after the Second World War. I think a turning point was the publication in 1958 of the uh, paper from Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley on the action potential in urine, which deserved them the, the Nobel Prize in 1963. This was one of the first examples where a systematic, mathematical, deductive approach, uh, typical of physical science, was used in medicine, in physiology in this case, and produced uh, extraordinarily valuable results. Um, around this agenda in the two, in 2005, the idea of uh, creating a computer representation of the human body that could be used as the children support system in, in hospitals uh, was started. And in Europe, the term we use at that time was the virtual physiological human. Um, over the years, this idea expanded and became a reality. And now we can say, yes, computer model, mathematical model can predict health. Uh, and here there is a list of uh, absolutely partial and incomplete, but it gives you the span from uh, uh, prostatectomy to diabetes, to osteoporosis, uh, to cardiotoxicity, uh, to uh, cardiosurgery, and so on. Um, what are the success stories that we observe in, in the last few years in terms of using models as a regulatory tool for new medical products? Well, a first important event was the acceptance in 2008 by the FDA of the possibility of using um, a model, um, uh, an in silico model, as an alternative to animal exper experimentation to test algorithms that controlled artificial pancreas for children with, with diabetes type 1. Um, that was a very important step. It was the first time that a, a complex uh, physiology based uh, um, model. Uh, involving patient-specific models, modeling was used in such context, but uh, it was also a very, very special context. Uh, uh, and I have to say, the agenda was driven by the patient association in this case. So again, very important, the involvement of, of the patient in this conversation from day one. Um, so this didn't follow up. There was no major breakthrough for quite a bit of years, okay, after the 2008 approval. Uh, we have to wait until uh, many years after when recently the FDA accepted as a possible replacement for animal experiment uh, a complete in silico pathway to demonstrate the so-called MRI safety. Uh, medical devices that are implanted in the body um, may create problem if the patient wearing the, the device then has to undergo an MRI. Uh, so uh, now medical device have to declare whether they are MRI safe or not. This is a sort of additional certification. And to do this now, at least in the United States, you can use 
a completely in silico pathway not in, as opposite to very complex uh, animal experiments. Um, the Laxtas test story, it's a few years ago. Um, this was a submission by Medtronix, uh, and again, FDA accepted uh, uh, a scenario where a particular um, requirement with this new um, uh, defibrillator developed by, um, uh, by Medtronic, uh, a requirement related to the risk of uh, uh, mechanical failure of the leads connecting the, the unit to the electrodes, uh, was studied by combining a physical patient in a, enrolled in a clinical trial with virtual patient run in an in silico model. Um, but the good news kind of hand here in the sense that as you notice, all the example I made are related to medical devices. Uh, we have still a lot of problems in terms of adoption around in silico uh, trials in general, but, and, and, and here there are listed some, but a big one is related to the use of this technology in the certification of medicinal products. So as part of the in silico world project that I lead, we are currently preparing two qualification advice with the European Medicine Agency. One for an in silico trial solution aimed to test, to, to help testing new um, osteoporosis treatments and one uh, aimed to test new treatment for tuberculosis. Uh, what we expect with this submission is to start a public discussion with the, the regulator, in this case, the European Medicine Agency, and develop a mutual understanding of what the problem, what are the barriers that are making difficult the, um, the adoption. In the meanwhile, uh, we are uh, trying to consolidate the community of practice made of academics, people working in industry, regulators themselves, uh, experts in various agency uh, who are interested and involved uh, in, in this topic to join our in silico world community of practice. Um, there are a number of challenges that discuss all, all relevant topics related to in silico medicine, but one particularly important is the one where we are driving the so-called good simulation practice. This is a position paper uh, that we are developing with the contribution of more than 100 experts. Um, uh, and we hope it will provide a sort of a baseline for the good practice when you want to use a computer model to support evidences in a regulatory process for medical device, but also for medicinal products. Um, there are still major topic being discussed. For example, recently we realized that the term in silico trials, which sounds very elegant in, in the general conversation where the word trial means experiment, in the specific regulatory context is misleading because in the regulatory context, trial is uh, an interventional clinical trial. Um, so um, we are now starting to use the, uh, different terminologies. We call it in silico methodologies. Um, uh, the, the, the only technical standard we have that support the, the, the evaluation of credibility for models in this context is the ASME VNV40, which however was not conceived for data-driven model. So it's not clear how we can validate data-driven model, which are an important subcategory. Uh, of in silico trials. And then there is a very complicated discussion going on with the drug regulator around whether we should separate technical and clinical validation. I don't have the time to enter into the detail, but it's really two different points of view clashing here. Um, I would stop here. Uh, unfortunately, I have to finish uh, on a negative note. Um, I did not plan for one hour delay, I'm sorry. And I have another obligation, so at one point I will have to quietly disappear. I'm very sorry for this, but I cannot avoid it. Thank you. It's time for Luca Emily. I think that he's here. Uh, Luca is an entrepreneur and investor. It's the founder and current CEO in Silico Trial Technologies, the first global platform that it's making easy to use modeling and simulation to accelerate the pace of innovation in the healthcare and life science industry. 
So, Luca, please, we are our ears. And I also congratulate the speakers to stick time. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a moment to up, uh, integrate my computer here. So first of all, I have to say that I was really amazed by the presentation today from the uh, uh, researchers who have done the work uh, on the hands-on. Uh, when I heard that it was just 15 hours of work, I was really surprised about that because it looks like 15 days. So really congratulations to everyone. And I have to say that one element that uh, hit me a lot uh, on that is the fact that um, there was a um, very, very great combination in many of these projects regarding um, modeling simulation and AI. And uh, this is a topic that uh, I really love because uh, many times um, there is a discussion among the groups of uh, researchers on differentiation from AI and modeling simulation as we are doing modeling simulation, we are doing AI. So uh, there is a sort of, uh, let me say, fight from sometimes from the conceptual point of view. And this is something that I think uh, is not, it's not fine uh, for, for many reasons. First of all, because um, yeah, the idea of everyone is to use these kind of tools. I'm sharing the slides, so probably you are able to, to project. Yeah, okay. Um, as we are here to uh, accelerate the development of drugs and medical devices, at the end of the day, modeling simulation, AI, or, or scripting, Python, or MATLAB, they are just tools. What I think is really, really important in the mind of all of us is what we can do, what are the tools that we can use to accelerate that part. Uh, but there is another element that in this uh, activity of, let's say, hyper-acceleration of drug and medical devices that uh, these kind of digital tools can, can support, it is the regulatory part. Uh, Mark already mentioned some of these here, there's slides where I'm referring to uh, what FDA is saying, that uh, now uh, computer generate a little part of the digital evidences for regulatory approval, while the, the, in the future they expect that uh, about 50% of the data used for the approval will come from virtual patient and computer. And also September last year, there was a vote by European Parliament that decided, um, well, that proposed, let me say, to ban the use of animals uh, in, in the uh, research. Uh, of course, uh, this was a proposal, not something that becoming effective now, but anyway, it's a, it's a push in this direction already. Marco mentioned some experiments, some activity. I can tell you that Roche, for example, public announced that by 2030, they want to uh, ban the use of animals in their own development. So when I, I was talking about AI, modeling simulation, etc., and now referring to, to regulation, one element that is very, very important, and this is uh, something that I launched in the community, is that uh, at the end of the day, for the understanding of the not expert people, um, uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, uh, I'm a degree in economy, so probably I'm the only one here with a degree in economy, and many times I find that I'm the only one with a degree in economy in many of the meetings, uh, PH, or Channel Alliance, and so on. Um, so I have a, a point of view that's a bit different, and also an entrepreneur, but um, I have, let's say, an outside point of view on, on some uh, scientific topic. And what I can see is that, of course, you, you can uh, see also as well that AI is uh, having a lot of echo, is a, we could say is a hype, but you're receiving investment, you're receiving attention, etc. While um, in the regulatory space, uh, of course, they have to consider these kind of tools. And uh, the qualification of AI tools by FDA are now a lot. Um, many of them are on imaging analysis. Um, while at the same time, we discuss about modeling simulation, integrating regulation to be accepted as an outcome and, and so on. And, and there will be in the future uh, probably a need of um, rationalization, where this is my point of view. Um, we will have to decide what is the, the name that cover everything that we are doing. As we as we have seen this morning, the presentation by the oh, this early afternoon by the by the um, uh, people who have work on, on this um, um, hands-on activity, you can say this is AI, this is model installation. Everything is combined. So probably we will have to 
find out uh, a term under a you know, sort of umbrella and to stay under that umbrella. Uh, and uh, probably, uh, I know that I'm saying something that don't, don't sound uh, nice to a lot of modelers, probably the AI is the name that we have to, to stay under. Not because from the scientific point of view, modeling is AI, but because we can't have two, three different names on digital tools that 99% of people is just to able to, to associate to a computer. And uh, um, that, that's one element. So food for thoughts, future discussion. I don't want to, to take much of your time about this, but the idea is that um, everything is mixing. Uh, so in the past, what people were doing client server or desktop, and then, okay, no, I'm doing desktop development. No, I'm doing client server. Oh, okay, this is better, this is worse. Or oh, I'm doing web-based. No, web-based is uh, secure. So it's, it's, it's informa informatic, it's IT, it's, it's development. So I don't want to banalize this part, but um, I think it would be very, very important from the regulatory point of view to think about that what you are doing is use of tools. It could be AI, it could be model installation, it could be other things. Uh, and uh, that would be very, very important to be sure that in the future regulation, there will be computerized system, computerized component that will be accepted in integration or uh, avoiding the fact that you go to go to um, animal or, or labs or human testing. So the market from this point of view is highly fragmented. So this is not really a, a, a market. If you think about the, the biggest company in the modeling simulation called the Certara, uh, make just 300 million of revenue worldwide. So probably there is no company that is market leader worldwide in any market that makes just 300 million of, of revenues. And uh, uh, there is also a shortage of expertise. We know here how hard it is to train someone that is knowledge in, in science, uh, uh, biology, uh, and then also computer simulation. So in fact, one of the things that impacted me was the, uh, the, the level of discussion uh, before on uh, scripting and Python and the use of AI tools, etc. So young generation are more um, common in, in this, uh, this kind of tools versus, uh, versus the others that so if you consider researchers 20 years ago, it was not like that. There are cybersecurity issues. This is something the company continues to talk about. And this activity is quite time-consuming time in not standardized process. Uh, before Marco mentioned the good simulation practices, and this is a very, very important initiative by the um, IV Channel Alliance, UPH, and in Silicon World, to uh, start to define uh, a framework for the use of modeling simulation towards uh, regulatory um, as activities. You have to consider that about 90% of the investments in the life science for R&D are under uh, regulatory definition. So not labs activity, but usually clinical trial and stuff like that. So it's where most of the money is going. And uh, to um, as we are talking about software, it's also important to consider that there is a business model trend for the software commercialization that uh, is uh, at the moment in 2022, basically software as a service, online uh, system, online platform. And this is growing. So everyone developing a software, we had also some presentation this morning, I have to think about that the software de developing is going to be provided to, com to other customers in a web-based solution, software as a service, etc. For, from this point of view, um, I had a previous experience as CEO of a cybersecurity startup from 2000 to 2010, and I can tell you that in 2001, going around talk about uh, cybersecurity, it's like to go in some company now to talk about modeling simulation. So people say, oh, what is that? No, I just hired a guy from a, com from a university, he's doing that, and now you know the story, so 20 years after. Um, so starting from this approach, uh, as in CECO trials, we started to work with a lot of researchers. Uh, now we are partnering uh, in this for all and the other three Horizon 2020 project with a lot of researchers, basically leveraging this business model. So giving the opportunity to uh, hospitals to provide uh, virtual patients and also to scientific partners that are more than 70 all around the world to provide us with their own simulation and AI tools developed that are integrated in the platform and provided to companies. We're working with CROs, uh, life science or drugs and medical devices company and, and now starting also to work with hospitals because basically what we want to do to facilitate the use of these kind of models going towards the 
uh, modernization of the of the uh, business model for the software is that uh, we want to change this approach. Now, company go uh, to a lot of researchers scattered through the world that are using modeling, but to provide uh, just uh, outcome, to provide uh, consultancy. They're not able to provide a scalable value of what they have developed to companies because the software they have developed, the component, the, the Python uh, tools or, or the models are not shareable because they embed all the know-how, so the, comp the, the researcher don't provide that to the company. What we're doing is that uh, once we have on a platform, the model developed by the researchers, covered by let's say, a layer that is a web interface that let the user just provide input or receive output, then we are protecting the IP that belongs to the researchers, but at the same time, we make it scalable for company to use these kind of digital tools. So once we talk about modeling simulation, we're talking about softwares. And the software need to be scalable. Otherwise, it's consultancy more than software. So please keep in mind this. Every time you approach some models, every time you approach some project where you have software, make it scalable. There was some question before also regarding startups, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Everything related to the market of software need to be scalable because this makes the people uh, be able to work in a democratization of the tools. This is something that all of us is benefiting and uh, taking the cost for the use of the model down and, and distributing knowledge uh, in a very effective way. Uh, in the platform we have developed, we are integrating different kind of models, model coming from the from the researchers, uh, model that we develop on demand. For example, now we one of our partner that is a spin-off of a university for a pharma company. We are customizing a model on a specific orthopedic area because they are providing us the data to make it uh, um, specific for a, an approval from a regulatory body. Or we use our platform to integrate the, the, the model that the company developed inside and then, then distribute inside their own network. Uh, now we're discussing, for example, with a pharma company that have more than 200 models developed inside and they are not able to distribute this model all around the world. So in this uh, approach, we have a scientific uh, uh, partner workflow. So we start from NDA, we evaluate the market, uh, then we evaluate the tool, and basically at the end of the day, we start to have the tool on the platform provided to the to the customer. I already mentioned we are working on Tree Horizon 2020. This is brain teaser in Silicon World Sim Cardio Test, and we have the there is a disk for all project. And uh, uh, very happy to talk with all the uh, developer, all the researcher that would like to take to the market models. And here are my contacts. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Luca, for this outstanding presentation. I hope that you have so many questions for Luca that we will just go before, sorry, after the, the presentations. Now let's move to our fourth speaker, Gordon Johnson, who is a charter engineer at Johnson & Johnson and has more than 25 years experience in medical device and pharmaceuticals companies. He will be representing his own views, but please listen carefully because Gordon has so much to say. So, Gordon, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Hello again, everyone. So, there we go, where's the pointer? Okay, so I'm going to be the odd one out because, uh, I don't know if I can get my mouse to work. Here we go. Oh dear. Hang on, get the mouse, get it back into. I know I'm using up valuable time. For some reason, it's disabled the mouse. Okay, hang on. Let's open up again. Okay, here we go. Yeah, some engineer. It just is jumping out the slideshow. I don't know why. There we go. Okay, okay, excellent, excellent. So, 
Yeah, I'm going to be the odd one out because everybody else who's spoken before me has kind of talked from the point of view of their own business. Uh, it's nothing mysterious, but... I'm sorry. I'm usually told I've got a very loud voice, but there we go. Okay, uh, so as I was saying, I'm going to do it a little differently from everybody else. I'm going to talk uh, on my own behalf instead of talking uh, for Johnson Johnson. I'm just required to do that by my company, and it's pretty normal for big organizations. Uh, and again, it's nothing mysterious. It's just that in such a big organization, you know, I can't answer specific questions in detail, <clears throat> you know, because I, I simply don't know the answers to all of those specific questions in detail. But what I can do is talk from a general industry perspective you know i'm part of i'm part of working groups within digital tool europe i'm part of working groups within medtech europe and i'll touch on it in a later slide but these have a real diversity of, of, of companies uh marta's already gone through that so I'll, I'll jump through it it sounds like i'm showing off uh so something to kind of really get across to you from an industry perspective if you're working as a specialist, as, as a subject matter expert, you know, as a computational modeling expert, as an artificial intelligence expert, you know, whatever, you have to work with non-technical stakeholders. You have to work with non-expert stakeholders. So even people that are supporting you making regulatory submissions, even people that are supporting you with policy, advancing policy positions to get in silico adopted, you know, the, these are not going to be close enough to you to ever learn all of the detail. So this is how it works in a mature scenario, right? We start with regulations from an ethical perspective. We, we, you know, you move on to standards. Sometimes the regulations get issued with guidance from the regulators just because, you know, they want to be more specific themselves. They don't want to wait for the standards to come. But you also have what we call horizontal and vertical standards. Horizontal standards are, you know, non-industry specific. And really, you want them to come out before the vertical standards because when, you, when, you, you know, when you're in a vertical standard scenario, you don't want to be arguing about the definitions of very simple terms, okay? You want the horizontal stuff to do that for you. You then have organizations, you know, have to build their own frameworks internally. So, you know, policies is where you'll see an organization speak to ethical intent. So they'll recognize the regulations, they'll speak to the basics of those regulations, but that's also where you'll see companies use the language that, you know, that speaks to ethical intent, okay? The, a, a credo, if you will, you know, a mindset, a belief system, okay? All, all, companies, all companies have them. Uh, you know, and fundamentally, you know, it's, it's about advancing healthcare. You know, it's about doing the best, you know, for, for, for the world as a whole. Uh, and then obviously, at the end of the day, and this is a very two-dimensional diagram, but all through that, and it's not just that blue jigsaw piece that speaks to people. There's people all through that, but ultimately, it's how, you know, the, the action, all of those previous steps speak to intent. It's, it's the action that decides, you know, ultimately what the ethical outcome is. So quickly, I'm, I know I have to move through these very quickly. I'm going to jump in and agree with Luca 100%. You know, it's the world that's going to decide what things are called. You know, we can call it in silico, we can call it computational modeling and simulation. You know, we can call it machine learning. But really, everybody's going to just start calling it artificial intelligence. Why? Because going back to the non-expert, the non-technical, everything's going to be a black box. And the, the, the buzzword label, label for that black box is artificial intelligence. What this is trying to get across to you is this is an unprecedented level of regulation you know this is this is global regulation for ai in three years and you can bet your bottom dollar that there will be overlap but there will be differences you know so uh, you know this all adds to the complexity this all adds to the complexity and, and most importantly where these regulations speak to is they don't just speak to the model that you're creating they just don't they don't just speak to the prediction right that you want from the model Ultimately, none of that works unless you have an architecture that's reliable and stable, right? So you need to think about full digital stack solutions. You need to think about IoT. You need to think about endpoint sensors. You need to think about database management. You know, most importantly, and this is, this is key for anybody who goes off into the future to work in, in machine learning in the clinical space, the clinical user is going to become the, the nexus for data collection. The clinical user is going to become the nexus for retraining of models. 
So, you know, they, they're going to have a really important role in the governance of, uh, of AI. So, for the most part, I'm going to generalize under that AI umbrella, but, you know, I will touch on in silico in a moment. So, yeah, just getting to that horizontal and vertical standards. Regulations tend to be very general, very high level. You know, they have to speak to legal clarity regulations, okay? They have to speak to legal clarity. So they, they can be very generalized, very simplified. Standards don't tell you exactly how you should do something, but they tell you how you can do something. And the reality of standards is once they exist, it tends to be the foundations on which notified bodies work. Okay, so if you're, if you're being inspected or you're handing in a submission and a standard exists, at least one standard exists, don't be surprised if that's the kind of minimum that the notified body is looking for. So, you know, the onus is on you because for the most part in silico AI for a long time to come is going to be a state-of-the-art conversation. You know, standards are going to come out and they're going to be redundant within a very short period of time. Or they're going to be up. They're going to be up for being updated. The regulations won't be. You don't really need to to change regulations that often. You know, maybe every sort of 15, 20 years, do you really need to revisit a regulation? One of the one of the sort of challenges we have at the moment is we have the medical device regulation, which has recently, you know, been applied. It's it's been signed off for a few years, but it's only recently come into being from an application point of view. The MDR does thankfully have one mention of in silico and one mention of computational modeling as evidence components. So that's really, really super helpful. What's happened is you also have the EU AI Act, which is currently going through the parliamentary process. And the challenge for the EU AI Act is it's a horizontal regulation. Uh, and it calls out, it, 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 it has pulled the MDR under its full umbrella. So, you know, myself and a lot of other people are currently advocating for, you know, a better balance there. But, you have problems with interplay between regulations and the, and the challenge you have as an organization is to kind of manage these aspects, okay? It's not the job of regulators to make it easy for you. It's not the job of standards organizations to make it easy for you. You know, they are all about protecting the consumer. So, you know, and, you know, industry is all about protecting the consumer. So it just adds more complexity to that, you know, the complexity that you're already dealing with in, in you know, creating credible models. Again, if you look over on the right, those are all the horizontal uh, standards that have came out from, for AI in the last couple of years, from ISO, IEC, IEEE, you know. <laughs> so again, standards don't tell you exactly how to do something. They tell you how you can do something. And the bottom line is, you know, with all of those different players, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways to peel an onion, okay? You also have vertical general standards like the ISO ones there for TC215. You know, and you can jump up and down that and depending on your areas of interest, you can see that there's, you know, generic vertical standards for the healthcare industry. And then sometimes you'll get a very specific technical standard. That's where, that's where you'll find the notified bodies being very, very specific. You know, if you have a technical standard. So, you know, if you're at the beginning of something, just you know, it's always worthwhile doing a little literature search <laughs> just to see what's out there, okay? And then that way you have guide rails and, or, or, you know, whatever you have to try and get, get beyond because ultimately you want to try and demonstrate that you're doing more than the standard. What's really changed in the last couple of years, and it goes back to that whole non-technical, non-expert conversation, is, you know, soft, it's still software at the end of the day, okay? It's still zeros and ones, <laughs> all right? It's still all of the things that come with that. It's still security, it's still version control, et cetera, et cetera. What's changed is you've introduced a whole new language that's challenging enough for the people close to the technology to, to agree on. But for the people who have to support, you know, the delivery of healthcare solutions, this new language obviously has created, you know, a, a lot of instability, you know, that... They, they find it difficult to even, you know, understand why they have to think about transparency when, you know, I learned transparency at school. Why is it, why is it a different meaning? You know, why is bias not what I understand bias to be? You know, what do you mean by statistical bias? What's the difference between that and societal bias, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is really, you know, one of the biggest challenges is that you've introduced all that, all that new language for non-technical people. 
Now, again, going back to the steady stream of guidances, regulations, and standards, you know, fortunately, the, the actual regulators forum has got together and kind of, you know, tried to get a handle on most of the big terms uh, right away. So that's really helpful for when you're talking to a regulatory manager or a, a you know somebody in, in legal in, in your business or somebody in the policy side in your business. You know, you can you can help uh, settle that conversation pretty quickly. And again, you know, th these aren't small documents. You know, the one on the left is something like 34 pages. The one on the right is something like 80. You know, you, you wouldn't believe that somebody can write an 80-page document on categories of bias. But there are literally about 30 to 40 categories of bias. One of them, and I'm not casting aspersions on anybody in the room, but one of them is on about doing something naughty to get funding. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so that's one of the categories of bias. And again, you know, no, no aspersions to the people in the room. Forgive me, I'm moving quickly through this. Hopefully I'm going faster. So yeah, just getting to the in silico side of things specifically, and, and you know, Marco's touched on it uh, in, 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 in good detail. Luke has mentioned it as well. You know, the device side of the world is, is ahead of this. You know, the drug side is catching up from a regulatory perspective. There, there are people in, in the, the drug regulatory business who have been behind in silico for a while, but you know, and Emmanuel and Cecile touched on this this morning. There's still a there's still a, a good majority of people on the drug side, you know, that, that kind of don't buy into the whole side of it. But there, there's no ignoring it. There's no ignoring it. And what's driving a lot of that, not being able to ignore it, is the way we make synthetic drugs now is moving increasingly to continuous manufacturing. You know, you don't want to you don't want to make drugs in batches. If you can make, you know, a month's worth of one drug and just split it up into into batches to suit yourself. So, you know, a lot of modeling is going on in pharmaceuticals, mechanistic modeling, chemometric modeling, surrogate modeling for, for batch release. Okay, quickly moving through that. Uh, this is digital Europe. This is digital Europe's membership. If you'd asked ten years ago what's going to be the membership of a healthcare consortium. Uh, it wouldn't have had Google in it. It wouldn't have had Rockwell Automation. It wouldn't have had NVIDIA, so on and so forth. So bearing in mind, you know, this is how seriously these organizations take regulations and standards it's to such an extent that, you know, Google have just hired the guy who used to be in charge of the digital health uh, unit in the FDA. Sorry, going again, quickly moving through. So, you know, ethically, this is Digital Europe again, very quickly, ethically. This is, this is Digital Europe, an industry organization proposing what a data sharing uh, framework should look like. You know, focus on health communities, you know, benefits for all, and a focus on digital health literacy. literacy. And this is really important, and it goes back to all those words that were falling out of the clouds earlier. Again, these are, these are super recent. Uh, a draft report from the Legal Committee to the European Parliament they're proposing a European Certificate of Ethical Compliance. It's going to be interesting how that gets put into practice. And the French presidency, uh, which I think is just coming to an end at the end of next month, they've introduced this uh, ethical principles. Humanistic values, you know, enabling... I think number two is going to be a difficult one to... Uh, but maybe we'll touch on that in the Q&A. And again, you know, despite everything you've heard, ultimately from an industry perspective, that's, that's how you operate. That's how we operate. That's how the regulators expect us to operate. So it's all about living into that, you know, living into the complexity, living into what evidence means going forward. You know, evidence is evidence. If you can prove that it's credible, whether it came from, you know, something in the physical world or something that came in the digital world, you know, it, it will we'll get over it. We will, we will get over it. It will not be an insurmountable challenge. So just on a final point, even if you don't have regulations, even if you don't have standards, those don't stop you getting market access. They don't stop you getting market approval. They just make it more challenging and, and more of a state-of-the-art conversation. Okay, and, you know, I'll show, I'm sure we'll show. The last point, yeah, there is always room for innovation. So don't think about this as, you know, you being put in a cage or, or a pair of handcuffs. It doesn't stop you from doing something, you know, really clever tomorrow. Thank you. Many thanks, Gordon. 
Well, I have to confess that I'm also biased to language, maybe because I am a scientist turned to communication, but I'm also aware of the importance to be clear and transparent when we want to communicate. So let's move on. And last but not least, Alessandro, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can oh, you hear me well? Great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's introduce Alessandro Blasimina, who is the reader of bioethics at ETH Zurich. He's an expert in translational medicine, precision medicine, regenerative medicine, genetic engineering, digital health, and aging. Alessandro, you have a little more time, although we are running late. So you have 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And yes, I will try to go um, uh, maybe five minutes shorter so that we can save some time for discussion later. So let me uh, share my screen. OK, I think it works. Yes, I see uh, from the window that you can see my screen. OK, good. So I was asked to uh, offer an, um, um, an overview of the most um, uh, pressing ethical challenges in the use of artificial intelligence in medicine. Uh, obviously, uh, the ethics of artificial intelligence is one of the most uh, rapidly growing uh, domains in, uh, in ethics in general. Uh, and definitely uh, the ethical issues around the use of AI in medicine are among the most interesting uh, and the more uh, uncertain uh, part of this, uh, of this conversation. So I was thinking that today I might do um, a good service to you if I could um, uh, give you an overview of uh, AI and its associated ethical challenges in three uh, specific domains, that is biomedical research, clinical applications, and public health. Uh, I will go through this quite rapidly through uh, a few examples, and then I will focus on what are uh, the, uh, the most interesting ethical issues and challenges in this, uh, in this space, and I will close with some reflections on where uh, regulation is uh, going in order to catch up with these, uh, with these emerging ethical issues, and uh, I will tell you my personal view on whether the current direction of a regulatory, emerging regulatory efforts is uh, the appropriate one. Um, okay. So let's start with biomedical research. As I said, I will only give you uh, an, a, a, a brief uh, taste of uh, the, the direction of the, of the general discussion here. Um, one of the uh, most uh, interesting areas uh, in, uh, in research uh, that features uh, uh, the use of AI is uh, about areas that are deeply um, driven by, by big data and uh, some of the most readily available um, uh, health-related data that we have is electronic health records. Uh, electronic health records are uh, possibly a, a very valuable source of health-related information, not only for uh, purposes like uh, optimization of, um, of health management at the level of healthcare institutions, but also for um, uh, purposes like um, uh, outcome prediction or uh, phenotyping and so on and so forth. Um, in particular, in the domain of precision medicine, there is a strong interest for uh, harnessing the potential of um, uh, huge amounts of electronic health records uh, um, uh, to be interrogated with the aim of deep learning. Uh, in order to conduct uh, longitudinal, uh, large-scale longitudinal studies on, in precision medicine. Uh, of course, the, uh, this, this, is, this is not limited just to uh, clinical uh, data, but also involves the use of social and behavioral data. Uh, and there are problems associated with these attempts because uh, as rich as these uh, uh, data sets might ever be, 
uh, the, there is a problem uh, of composition of the existing data sets. These data sets are often uh, very biased in, uh, in uh, social demographic ways. And therefore, there are concerns about how, whether the, the use of uh, electronic health records to study uh, patterns of um, of health uh, inequality might actually uh, contribute to the perpetuation of those uh, inequalities because of the um, unstructured and unsystematic nature of these uh, of these data used to train uh, AI algorithms. Another area of interest uh, for the use of AI is drug discovery, of course, and uh, drug discoveries, dr drug, the use of AI for drug discovery is again um, uh, very appealing because it can help uh, predict um, chemical, chemical and physiological features of, uh, of uh, molecules and also um, um, uh, help uh, designing new molecules for molecular targets. Uh, this area is less controversial from, from an ethical point of view, but uh, the problem here is that, as, um, as we have alluded to in the discussions uh, that we had so far, these algorithms are fundamentally black boxes. Uh, the interpretation of which is very problematic. So there is a lot of discussion about the development of explainable artificial intelligence algorithms in uh, drug discovery. Uh, of course, explainability is a problem that cuts through uh, all the, um, the possible application of applications of AI to uh, medical issues. And, and, we, and we would go back to this, uh, to this problem later on in this presentation. There are ways to uh, dispel some of the opacity of AI algorithms also in the domain of drug discovery. But the problem here is um, basically that ex lack of explainability or lack of transparency is a limiting factor for uh, uh, drug discovery because um, uh, those algorithms would have to dry, uh, drive investment in, uh, in uh, pharmacological development uh, of specific compounds uh, without knowing uh, what uh, without knowing a lot about the um, uh, mechanistic, uh, the mechanistic explanation behind the prediction of the uh, of the AI in this domain. Um, Another issue that we have with uh, drug discovery and AI is the problem of du dual use, meaning the possible um, uh, misuse of uh, these kind of technologies for um, purposes that have nothing to do with um, finding new uh, uh, chemical uh, pharmacological weapons against human disease, but actually uh, some people are worried that the same, the very same algorithms might uh, help developing um, developing um, uh, weapons, biological weapons, or uh, tools for bioterrorism. This is not specific to uh, to the uh, domain of AI. It's it's a conversation that has long been going on, for example, in the domain of synthetic biology. If you think of gain of function research on uh, human viruses, we, we have heard these over and over again. But I just wanted to point out that this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, arguably the most um, interesting uh, applications of AI in medicine have to do with um, uh, AI-driven predictions in the domain of clinical medicine. Uh, here is a, a very, very uh, typical example of uh, an AI, a deep neural network that is able to uh, classify um, uh, skin cancer or uh, any any uh, skin uh, lesion um, based on features that are morphological um, uh, and, um, and and so on. So the idea here is to develop an algorithm that can perform a diagnosis. Or as you see on the uh, on the right here, uh, an algorithm that can predict, uh, in this case, cardiovascular risk. Sorry, uh, by looking at uh, images of the uh, retinal the retinal fundus of the of the patients. So uh, this is particularly interesting 
interesting because if you read the paper, the, uh, the researchers admit that actually they had no uh, reason to believe that these kind of images would contain uh, information about cardiovascular risk in the first place. So they were really shooting in the dark, uh, so to say, in this, in this particular case. But you can imagine how this kind of uh, technical development might actually um, really uh, be a game changer in, in medicine. Uh, of course, uh, with COVID-19, we have seen an explosion of AI application. This, in, this is in particular um, a tool to uh, prognosticate um, uh, COVID-19 patients based on uh, um, chest X-ray and clinical data. Um, uh, so basically, here you have yet another uh, possibility to use uh, to use AI in uh, clinical medicine. This is an algorithm, a very interesting one, to predict mortality risk in uh, COVID nineteen patient. And what is interesting here, from an ethical point of view, is that if you look at this um, at this graph on the right. This is a representation of the clinical features that uh, the algorithm is taking uh, into account. And those at the top are those that, the, that, are, the, that are more meaningful for, to the prediction made by the algorithm. And of course, you see at the top of it, age. So this is an algorithm that systematically, so to say, um, uh, penalizes people uh, um, from, due to their, their age. So whether we want an algorithm to take into account a variable that we know is associated with the risk of mortality uh, with this disease, uh, or not, it's uh, not only a clinical question, but also an ethical one. So do we really want an algorithm that, uh, that gives so much weight, weight, uh, weight to age as a, as a predictor? Of course, it is a predictor and we know it, but if any uh, clinical decision should be automated based on that, we should take into account the risk of what ethicists call ageism, that is discrimination uh, against people due to their age. Um, these are other examples of algorithms that can uh, harness electronic health records to uh, optimize um, uh, to optimize patient management, so they might also be able to reduce healthcare costs. Uh, but uh, in fact, this is uh, this is um, uh, an issue that needs to be uh, addressed also from an ethics point of view. Um, on the right, you see an algorithm that can predict short-term mortality in uh, cancer patients. Um, that is, uh, again, uh, interesting uh, uh, as an aid to decisions, for example, about starting a new uh, sorry, a new uh, cycle of chemotherapy. Um, again, this is uh, not only a clinical issue, but also an ethical one. We need to take into account the preferences of the patient and uh, the quality of life of the patient and whether it is uh, the right thing for a given patient to start another round of chemotherapy rather than dying uh, peacefully at home, for example. Uh, in the wake of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen a lot of discussion about the use of digital tools in uh, public health. Uh, definitely, uh, digital contact tracing apps uh, have been uh, the most prominent uh, of these technologies. We, most of us have downloaded one of, or the other version of these apps. And uh, the same is true of uh, digital um, vaccine certification apps. And in Europe, we had a pan-European initiative about that. But actually, um, uh, less attention has been paid to the explosion of research for the use of artificial intelligence in the context of COVID-19. Um, and this uh, applies uh, to the full spectrum from diagnosis to uh, epidemiological studies uh, and uh, treatment, vaccination, everything. And this kind of research uh, involved all sorts of, all versions of uh, AI models, and as well, uh, it um, relied on the use of uh, a huge variety of different data sources. So this is uh, a few examples, uh, apps that through um, AI were uh, allegedly able to uh, make a diagnosis based on how 
the cuff of a, of a patient with sound. Here we have obviously big problems of uh, validations, especially validations uh, during the rushed uh, uh, medical pace of, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, and here you have another example. This is an algorithm that was used in Greece to screen for uh, incoming uh, passengers who would be more at risk of carrying the, uh, the infection into the country. So this algorithm basically um, um, uh, triages pa patients, uh, sorry, patients uh, for uh, testing and uh, self-isolation uh, upon entering uh, the borders of Greece. So this is something that was actually used for real. Um, as, I, as I said, uh, there is a, a huge uh, uh, array of uh, ethical uh, uh, debates going on around the use of AI for medicine, from privacy to informed consent, uh, to uh, biased algorithms, to issues of liability, explainability, and so on. Uh, I would focus on a, a subset of these issues uh, in the interest of time. Um, algorithmic bias is definitely among the most hotly discussed issues. We know that, uh, you know, the adage garbage in, garbage out applies to the use of data also to train medical uh, AI algorithms. So these algorithms, uh, depending on the composition of training data sets, are prone to either bias, um, this underfitting or uh, variance that is the risk of overfitting or uh, the discoveries of spurious uh, correlations, of course. In both cases, the risk is that implementing AI uh, algorithms uh, uh, on a large scale might actually exacerbate existing health inequalities. And this is a concern that uh, many are working on from an ethical point of view, but also from a, um, from a, a technical point of view uh, with technical solutions to mitigate the risk of bias emerging um, basically regularly every day in the literature. Uh, what will happen to uh, clinical, the clinical responsibility of doctors once uh, AI will automate part at least of medical decision making is a, an important legal issue that is still uh, open and unsettled. Um, but definitely the most uh, discussed issue in this space is explainability. So uh, these algorithms we know are black boxes, so we don't know uh, what uh, the algorithm has learned um, to uh, be able to perform its predictions and to, to do its clusterings and to basically uh, model the most salient, statistically salient features of the phenomenon that we ask uh, the, the algorithm to uh, apply uh, to apply to. But what, it, what do we mean with opacity? What do we mean with lack of explainability? Well, uh, different people mean different things. This is a, um, uh, an overview of the most common understandings of opacity, that is impossibility to access the rules that an algorithm has learned or impossibility to make sense of them due to excessive complexity. Or uh, the last um, option is that uh, an algorithm is said to be opaque when it is impossible to understand what is that associates input and output from a mechanistic uh, point of view. Um, now, this issue uh, cuts through an, an important uh, issue in philosophy of medicine, that is what constitutes uh, a justified medical act, a, a medical act. So a doctor is supposed to be know what she, uh, she's doing, not just uh, trying things out for no reason. So in the presence of opacity, uh, does it still make sense to say that medical decision making is uh, based upon justifying reason? reasons, uh, reasons that can be either theoretical or practical. Now I will skip uh, the details here because uh, I don't want to eat up too much time, but it's clear that explainability is um, something that runs the risk, uh, or I should say lack of explainability is something that lack, uh, runs the risk of uh, jeopardizing um, sound and justified medical acts. Uh, unless we adopt uh, a different sort of uh, paradigm. So this is what uh, certain commentators in the field are uh, arguing for, that we should only care about the accuracy of AI algorithms and uh, not be too much 
obsessed by uh, explainability requirements. Uh, nevertheless, there is a lot of research on how to make uh, deep learning algorithms explainable, at least uh, post hoc. So when we have a very complex models, some people are arguing that we can rely on uh, heat maps that highlight, for example, in the case of images, highlight the areas of, uh, of a medical image that the algorithm is attributing uh, a lot of importance to. But this is also risky because uh, um, uh, because of the risk of confirmatory bias on the part of doctors, um, and actually uh, even um, not perf perfectly accurate uh, networks can produce saliency maps or heat maps that can reappear uh, reassuring can reappear reassuring to doctors without actually providing much of a, uh, of a, an explanation to uh, the prediction made by the algorithm. Uh, this is why a lot of people are actually ar arguing that we should um, we should not run those risks of being further uh, confused by existing methods of explainability. Uh, and we have uh, summarized some of these uh, considerations in, uh, in some papers, some publications recently. So I'm just putting them here. For you, for those of you who are interested to uh, to check further, but one lingering issue is that uh, maybe we should also um, be focusing our attention and the attention of regulation on what constitutes a valid, a clinical, a uh, good clinical validation of an AI algorithm, and al uh, a topic that we have already discussed and that I think we will discuss uh, later on in the roundtable, uh, because evidence shows that only a handful of the of um, uh, AI uh, algorithms for medicine are actually um, validated through uh, randomized controlled clinical trials, which might or might not be the gold standard in this field, but still uh, it's, not, uh, it's not very uh, widespread uh, at the moment. AI solutionism is the last uh, problem that I want to uh, focus on. Uh, this is the idea that as long as you have data, you can compute any human outcome based on machine learning. But there are uh, areas in which this is uh, not so obvious. For example, for uh, conditions like uh, autism spectrum disorder or um, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, the idea of making a diagnosis based on MRI images might sound interesting, but it's actually quite problematic because we have no reason at the moment to believe that these two conditions in particular um, have a counterpart in uh, uh, brain morphology. Uh, so basically trying to develop this kind of algorithm is quite a risky business, uh, especially for patients that, that, that will end up being uh, diagnosed in this way, uh, basically without, um, without uh, knowing anything about the causal domain model that should support the rationale for uh, doing that in the first place. So uh, I want to close with some uh, very limited... Um, Sorry, Alessandro, but uh, we are 22 minutes. <laughs> Yes, yes, I'm, I'm done. Uh, so existing horizontal regulation is uh, already paying attention to uh, explanatory uh, issues in, uh, in uh, AI. Um, so this is from the GDPR. The AI Act is also containing provisions about uh, transparency. Uh, but I would like to argue that actually uh, it's not very clear what the focus of this, the ethical focus of these regulations uh, is. So is this emerging regulation really trying to protect the well-being and the rights of research participants and patients or what I have? I leave it as an open question. My own view is that uh, the focus on the of these regulations is actually not uh, that uh, that I put up in this slide here. So I leave that as a, as an open uh, issue for discussion later on, and I'm done. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Alessandro. Uh, well, actually, we are at the end of the session, <laughs> according to time. Um, I will ask speakers that are here in the room to come at the front, please. 
If you agree, I think that we can leave the discussion for 30 more minutes. What do you think, Jerome? Well, I will just uh, cut some of the questions that I have prepared. I will try to select the most interesting ones. Uh, but I also encourage you to start thinking about anything you want to, to ask, because uh, we will have the last five, ten minutes for you to, to talk with the speakers. Okay, so. Uh, let me think. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think that's pretty clear from the talks that our speakers have given that digital health is transforming our healthcare systems in all the world. It promises benefits for patients, but also I think that it can let, as some of you have uh, pointed out, some two health inequalities. For instance, digital literacy can lead to unequal access to health systems. And I'm thinking about uh, poor people, also to homeless or people suffering from some diseases. So I will ask to, I think that Marco, are you here with us? Yes. Okay, so, <laughs> <You mean still. laughs> okay, so I have all six of you. So to all of you, I will ask you to, um, to know, how can we guarantee a fair digital healthcare system for everybody? Anyone who want to, to begin? Okay, Luca? <laughs> Yeah, let me be provocative. I mean, I don't think that this is going to take to inequality. I think it's going to take to equality. For the reason that software is one of the most modern way to distribute uh, know-how and content. But it depends, of course, from the point of view. So if you look at just Europe, then this could be. But if you look at about the world, where there is China and in India and Africa, where there are not healthcare systems like ours, they start from scratch. The opportunity there to use these kind of digital tools, in fact, they are investing a lot in this direction, is going to have that kind of population be able to access to innovative uh, uh, tools, innovative digital tools that otherwise in the traditional approach would not be available for them. So the, the standard healthcare system would not ever be available in Africa or in China, in India for, for obvious infrastructure reason. I will make just a very simple example on the surgical uh, um, surgical robots. Uh, recently, Da Vinci, that, have been, that after they have been trained by thousands of, of millions of, of surgery, have been able to execute a surgery all alone without the support of a, sur a surgeon. So this is, of course, opening a world, but it's also opening a world for people that is not living near the hospital and that uh, maybe could be live uh, near a robot and uh, could uh, be more uh, living in a more equal uh, healthcare ecosystem. So, uh, as I said, it's provocative. Of course, a lot of other complex elements, but uh, it depends on the point of view. So this kind of uh, digitalization that, as I said before, is uh, giving opportunity to make scalable things that are very complex in terms of know-how, because unfortunately we have to consider that our good doctor, but also bad, doc bad doctor, uh, to train a good doctor is not easy while the software, once they are good, they are good for everyone. And the cost of execution, and don't forget for a moment the, the license price, but the cost of execution is very low usually. And so this is, could take potentially to a better equality in terms of access of know-how, analysis, and so on, because otherwise, if you have a good uh, machine but you're not able to analyze the X-ray or MRI because you have not a good radiologist, only with the software you will be able to do that if you are in a remote place and most of the people is not living now near hospitals, worldwide level. Gordon? Yeah, I mean, it's it, just, to, just to back up what Luca was saying, you know, that the thing with software, we live we live in an increasingly virtualized world, you know, and uh, it, it just just the f very fact that you can adapt solutions to the level of technology in, in particular countries as well. You know, we obviously you know here in 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 the Western world or in Europe in particular, you know, architecturally, you know, we have everything, you know, either located here. Or, or accessible here, and, and really that's the question. The question is, you know, how how quickly can we can we make it scalable? You know, is 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 you know certain speeds for certain places and certain populations 
but you but you need you need a collective you need a collective so although we can we can manage that collective you know from a, from a regional point of view we can sometimes manage that collective from a global point of view but you need you need regulators to agree to at least harmonize you need standards organizations to commit to a more collaborative future and and not feel that they all need to get and you know stake in the game <laughs> you know which is which is you know pretty evident you yeah. can see from from the work that's been going on uh, to maybe uh, hopefully I'm, I'm supporting what Luca was saying in the sense that there are any number of paradigms you know the power of the clinician is going to change the balance of the power of the clinician is going to change the balance of you know the the, the authority of the patient is going to change you know from a from a from an accessibility point of view, I don't want to get into an explainability and interpretability conversation because that can easily become a conversation about, you know, making something complicated that you don't understand in order to explain something complicated that you don't understand. But transparency can, can work on many levels, but people have to be careful with the responsibility that comes with that transparency. You know, it's... Uh, you know, as soon as you have something that's, you know, software is very portable. It's very easy to, to give, you know, a regulator full access to, you know, to, to systems at any level. But, but with, that, with that comes, you know, a certain responsibility. Uh, and the same for patient organisations. I think you'd find a lot of healthcare manufacturers would be very open to that conversation. But again, you know, it, it, it comes with responsibility. So, you know, all, all of those kind of paradigms are, are, are in play. Yeah, we will talk about responsibilities and of all stakeholders later. But I think it's a very interesting question that you are pointing here. Josep. Yeah, well, I think this is a very, I think I am happy to be here because it's a lot of things that we can discuss, no? I am clinical pharmacologist. I stay in my life making clinical trials, even if I am patients. And in order to be very clear is that uh, the scientific method the best is the clinical trial, randomized, prospective, well done, and well published. I think this is a, no discussion, and this is normally that when it's a drug or a procedure or something, is a, when it's approved by health authorities, is because you know there is evidence of the worst. No, it's clinical trial, randomized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, no? I think this is very important. No, there is other studies that, for example, case control studies, epidemiological studies, you know. Uh, um, that can help a lot, that big data, and you know, this can help a lot. Uh, we, are, we are working in this, in this issue, WAFI, uh, and I think it's, uh, you know, that all discussed today, I think it's very important, not the intelligent artificial or the silico trials, no? Uh, we are working in this, in this uh, work in the, in the European Agency of Drug, we are in the panel, and also in the Spanish Agency, and we are working with this foundation in the FDA. And here there are some important points. I'm sure that will be uh, very positive, you know, this approach. But there are some issues that we must, you know, take care. Is the first is that what does mean digital patient? What does mean digital patient? Uh, theoretically, yes, it's a patient that is in the in the computer, but it's not exactly the same that a patient when we ask to the patients in the classic in the classic, uh, you know. Uh, office of the doctor in a clinical trial is not exactly the, the same that in the digital. That means that this is a very important issue, no? because we know very well when we ask to the patients, it depends on the doctor or the nurse, ask to the patients from one uh, manner or other manner could be different of the, of the results. We know that, and which is published. I mean, we are not saying nothing new. No, That means that I think it's uh, very important that to know exactly what are the patients we are making in these silico trials, we can say, first. Second, I think it's very important to train to the, our patients, because, for example, in our disease, we have elderly people. You know, are they are not, not all, but they're not habituated to work in digital terms. That means that we need here also to adapt, okay? I think this is a very important issue that I think we can adapt, no? But this is an, an, a very important issue, no? That means that the interaction between doctors, patients, in, in this context, I think it's uh, a, a, a very important. And in fact, you know, it was said by the, by the others, uh, you know, partners in the discussion, is that I think it's very important that it's not, not easy to validate, to validate, you know, the, 
the, the classical, we can say clinical trial, with uh, you know, the silicon trials. I mean, to know sure that, because the algorithm could be changed, could be changed. I mean, in any way, I am sure that, for example, that could be a very useful tool. Hmm? I mean, I'm sure, I completely agree with you. But uh, we need to pay attention because a lot of things must be done, especially in the, in the field of the relation between patients and doctors, when the doctors or nurses or the people that are making the research, the clinical research, they're asking to the patients. I think this is a very important issue, no? And the ethical issues is important, and also the participation of the patients, I think, would be improved. Uh, but this is more or less to put it in the table of the discussion, no? I mean, there's a lot of work must be done in this, in this, uh, in this context, in, in my point of view. Okay, thank you, Josep. I think that yeah, it's very important what you all three have said, like uh, to grant education and to, to put the infrastructure to every people get access to this technology. I think that we just, uh, Marco is off of the meeting. So, Alessandro, do you have anything to add on this topic? Yeah, I just wanted to, to point out that the issue of um, inequality plays out in uh, at least two big um, um, two big uh, domains. So, uh, it, it, as a matter of global health, um, of course, there is uh, issues to uh, to be discussed about whether and to which extent uh, people in low to middle income income country might actually benefit from digital health innovation. I think that some commentators are rather skeptical. Uh, some are very enthusiastic, but uh, there are, uh, I think, uh, some, um, some forms of digital health that might be um, better suited to uh, low and middle income countries and others that are uh, just not, uh, not imaginable. I mean, just to, um, uh, the, 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 if the technologies are being developed in the uh, western, northern part of the world, uh, chances are that they will not be uh, that they will not be targeting uh, diseases that are more uh, prevalent or uh, health issues that are more uh, remarkable in uh, other parts of the world. So this is one element that applies to uh, to the agenda of digital medicine, but. In general, it's uh, it's not specific to it. I mean, it's uh, it's a general problem of uh, of uh, medical innovation in general. And the other do domain uh, is uh, is more um, uh, is more social inequalities. The effect of social inequality on on the development of digital technologies for health. So, for example. Uh, one one case that has been uh, also making headlines um, recently is the fact that uh, pulse oximetry devices, for example, are uh, working uh, at a much lower rate of performance with um, uh, people with dark uh, skin. Uh, so the, they were very inaccurate uh, if used by black people, for example, as compared to when they were used by uh, white people. So this is uh, this is a problem that needs to be taken seriously, and uh, standards can be developed on how to mitigate this risk. Uh, and it's important, I guess, that we keep the um, the topic in the conversation. Uh, at all levels, from the level of developers to um, regulatory bodies, uh, legislators, and um, and the public as well. I mean, this is a problem that can only be addressed if there is a concerted effort in uh, uh, making uh, health data more uh, equitable, more representative of all uh, ethnic groups, of all uh, um, uh, social demographic groups, uh, age groups, uh, etc. We know that the health data that we have today greatly overrepresent while male middle age patients. Uh, this is a fact. I mean, across all domains of medicine, from genetics to uh, to biobanks, we know that uh, there are efforts underway to mitigate this problem. For example, the precision medicine program in the in the U.S. the the, the new precision medicine court uh, that is called All of Us. Uh, 
uh, have been created with the aim of being more representative than uh, uh, normal biobanks. And I think that this is a, uh, a, good, a good thing. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you about the bias of the data that we have available today. And talking about data, Alessandro, I will also ask you about, uh, do you think that we are able nowadays to secure privacy of patients' data? I mean, technically, it's uh, uh, there have been a lot of uh, advances in uh, in cryptography and uh, a lot of the, of the health data that are used in um, in uh, in biomedical research, for example, need to comply with very strict standards. And in this respect, uh, I mean, even the GDPR is a good uh, example of how regulators can be aware of these problems. Uh, nevertheless, uh, health data are the most uh, frequently hacked uh, kind of data that that we know of. So uh, the, the problem is not is not over. So I, I would say that there are two ways to to tackle this problem. On the one end, you uh, there are the technical safeguards, of course, uh, pseudonymizing data or anonymizing data for research purposes, but these are not as valuable in the domain of, uh, of clinical use of data. Uh, the other uh, issue is to uh, make the consequences of data uh, pri privacy breaches less uh, harmful for uh, data subjects. That means uh, having in place better uh, anti-discrimination laws and, um, and, and, and these kind of things. So there, there are interventions that can be um, mitigating the uh, harmful effects of uh, privacy breaches uh, downstream of breaches. So uh, to, to, on the one end, we should try to prevent um, privacy breaches. On the other end, we should try to prevent the harmful consequences of breaches when they occur. So I think that uh, at this moment, there is no 100% privacy and, and probably we should get used to the fact that this is an ideal that will never be in place despite remarkable improvements in technology. But just one last point, this shouldn't prevent us from uh, advocating for data sharing and for uh, widespread use of uh, health health data because there is value in this data. It would be a pity not to uh, not to um, extract this value for the benefit of patients, of course. Yeah, sure, Jose Manuel. I don't know if you uh, want to add something. I don't know if are you yes. here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, uh, is uh, the same point. <clears throat> it's difficult to 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 us uh, as a clinician that participates in in the validation phase from some uh, EA tools uh, to to explain to the patient uh, in order to to the patient be uh, to, to be clear. Where is participating, and this, uh, this is very important for us. And another point uh, that the patient sometimes uh, asks is, uh, yes, uh, you can use uh, my data, uh, but only for this purpose. That please don't use my data for uh, any related uh, purpose on our posterior in the research activities. And this point have to be, or for for our point of view. Uh, Present a gray area that uh, that is important to to clarify. When can we uh, we use uh, in a retrospective way uh, patients' data uh, for uh, purposes that uh, the patient have uh, has not given the the consent the informed consent uh, from the patient. Okay, that's an interesting point because it's also the next question. I would ask, I like to ask Giuseppe about, do you think that patients should be the sole owners of their data? And to the other speakers, as Jose Manuel was saying, if we can share or we should share their data and with whom? That is a very important question. No? Um, I, think, I think for me, as I am patient representative, the, the data are from the patient, okay, for me. I mean, uh, it's a philosophical issue, no? And now, for example, in, the, in Spain, for example, in the clinical hospitals, if you patients 
can ask to the doctors. For example, I can example in the clinical hospital, the patients can see before the radiography than doctors. That means a new tool, because before, you know, all the doctors, they have all the, the data, no? And, uh, and even now happen. Uh, I mean, that sometimes patients ask to the doctor, please, can you give me my radiography or you can give me a report? And it, sometimes there is some resistance. I think patients has the right to have all the data from them, the source, no? Second, uh, it could be controversial, the second point, because I, 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 normally the patient, the patient is very in favor to, to be open uh, and to help to her doctor or they, when they are in the clinical trials, they're very open. That means that I am not sure that the patients in general are against that the data could be to have with, a, with a other doctors or, we, or with a project. I mean, you can ask to them to sign and I think it's very important, and normally is is done, is that to ask in in the the permission, the permission to the patients. No? But for me, I think that it's not good. For example, is that sometimes happen even in the classical clinical trial, that sometimes patients go to the trial and in the end, when they finish, they don't know exactly if they take in the placebo group or if they are taking the the, the drug. Huh? That it's not correct. I mean. When you ask to the patients to go in the clinical trial, when the trial is finished, the doctor or the nurse should be explain if they are in the placebo group or in the control group. Sometimes it happens that the, the doctors, they forget it to explain to the patients because when a patient is making a clinical trial, they are doing a very important act that to put their body in order for research. And I think we must be respect about that. And to, when they finish the trial, to explain to the patient if they are in a control group or in this active group, how works, etc. I think this is a very important, it's a very important issue. No? Another issue is that, Marta, is that as you are here, people researchers and people from different, I recommend, as I, I explained at the beginning, to go to the, to the uh, patient societies at the beginning to explain about, about the, the project, to explain even about the intelligent, intelligent artificial intelligence or the silicon trials, whatever you want, to spread because they can help a lot. Because, for example, in our case, no, I will explain you, is that, for example, in the clinical trials in osteoarthritis, do you know what, what is the, the efficacy of the placebo? The placebo in clinical trials, see, in clinical trials is 60%. And sometimes I say, well, I can recommend placebo, no? because it's 60%. That is very important because we, we don't have uh, the method to analyze the pain is the Haskinson scale. Huh? I mean, it's validated worldwide by, by the FDA, by Paris Agency or whatever. Uh, you know, we don't have method. That means that sometimes when we ask to the patients at the, about the pain, it's very important that doctor ask the good question and it's very, or nurse, or and it's very important to explain, well, between zero and 10, what is your pain? Normally, patient pain, nine. Say, nine? Do you mean that 10? What, you, what does mean 10? That means that some bus, take your, your eh, eh, un, un autobús, te rompe la pierna. Esto es 10. <laughs> eh, perdona que lo diga en español, I'm sorry, it's in Spanish. And you say, my God, no, I have six. You, no, imagine, but this is very important. Because 10 is the maximum pain. Un tanque te pasa por encima, no? Eh? Perdona la expresión, ¿no? This is very important because if not you have a bias, sure. And, and we know, for example, in the case of OA, that we say the floor effect. Floor effect does mean when the patient not to, don't have too much pain, it's very difficult to say if the patient improve or not improve the pain. That means that in terms that we are speaking now, that means you were doing digital, that means we must be care and we and, and be sure, sure that we ask to the patients correctly, even if it's that digital patient. Huh? Because if not, could we have problems? And you can maybe approve a drug that is not worse in, in, in pain, or, or the opposite, you can take out a drug that works. That means that this context, it's complicated. I mean, uh, it's complicated, no? But, but I think it's very important. But, but my, my, my advice, if you permit to me, goes to the associations of patients, huh? and to, to, say, to ask to them if they can collaborate with you. Because we will see how, how the, 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 the knowledge that they have of the disease and could be very useful 
for the for the in this case for for the intention of artificial intelligence or the silico trials. I think because they can they can help and the patients normally are in favor because they would like to, to make my research to, to improve the, the disease, no? especially imagine when the people have pain, like as the case with osteoarthritis, no? You know, I think this is very important, no? So do you think that data should be shared? And yeah. you should educate also patients. Yes. Do you agree, Luca? I think in my, yeah. in my concern, yes. Yeah, I totally agree. I'll make an example. Uh, it's like uh, if you go to a doctor, you say, I am feeling bad. What do you have? Oh, I don't tell you. So, <laughs> so we, we have to develop drugs and medical devices. And the new technology to develop drug and medical devices, the effective one, etc., also for rare disease, is to have data. So people can decide not to share the data, but I have to say that now everyone has this kind of tools that is giving a lot of information all around, is collecting a lot of information. And from one side, we don't, we don't have so big problem to share. So we are living in a sharing world. So sometimes, probably once someone is asked to share the, day, the, the healthcare data, most of the people probably don't know what they are asked for. Because if you take away any kind of information that is able to identify the, the, the patient and then to discriminate, etc., I mean, your, your data are valuable for, for the public to the point that you could say, okay, I'm not using your data, but in the future, once a drug is developed for that, you're not going to access to that. It's like to say, everyone is here thanks to vaccine of COVID. If there was no vaccine, we wouldn't be here. Everyone would be at home with a mask and so on. It's because a lot of people went through the vaccination. So uh, I think that it's also a, a moral uh, you do to provide the data and to uh, to let the data once they do not uh, imply anything that is really personal. Because anyway, the data, they're not used by the data of Luca. They use data aggregated to hundreds of thousands of people and can help research. So once we establish that, once this is guaranteed, then I think it's really, really important there is a sharing of this information. And I think that from this point of view, the patient association can play a significant role because there was also a statistic going to uh, parents of, of children with a, with a very bad uh, disease. And it was not at all considering the, the problem to not sharing the data because they was helping their children. So it's really, really important. It's really important to share data, but it's really important to to discriminate how, what you are sharing so that you can uh, legitimately tutelate the patient. But once it's done, then let's share as much as possible and let's use as much as possible. Then the regulators have to define something that don't make this data sharing become a market because that's another problem. So it don't have to be a market, the, the, the data sharing or the data of patient, but if you would have the data of everyone that wouldn't be bad, would be great for researchers. And so, yeah. Yeah, you go to the point of usage of data also in industry and private sector. So Gordon, do you have anything to add about any misuse that can be done with this data? Yeah, Jerome talked about it. I thought I don't. Jerome talked about it earlier at the start of his presentation. And, and it speaks to the whole scalability conversation and, and you know, it's, it's emergent behavior. It's that aspect of emergent behavior. And, you know, in, isol in an isolated sense, it's very difficult to control that. But it's, you know, it's, it's that thing where you, you just have to, to, to think of the controls that can be reasonably established. Uh, you know, ultimately, you know, everybody at every level has, you know, an ethical, has professional ethics, you know. Clinicians have professional ethics. Providers have professional ethics. You know, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of ethical things that we already do. You know, cybersecurity is about people. Privacy is about people. You know, these things these things these things have had regulations in place for a while. You you have to, and no no industry player is going to say that they don't want a data sharing system, <laughs> right? No, because. Ultimately, you know, ultimately there's a commercial imperative. Of, of course there is. You know, one of, one of the big problems today, maybe not so much in Europe as in the United States, but it's the cost of, of drugs, co the cost of biologics. And a lot of, a lot of industry uh, players will say, well, you know, come and see the failure rate 
of of drug of drug uh, you know production you know from stage zero if we can call it that all the way through to stage three and release you know it's, it's something like ninety to ninety five percent depending on what drug or what biologic you look at now any any industry player is going to say I I, I have a I have a right to try and you know lower that failure rate you know and and if I can do it I'm not suggesting we suddenly create digital patients for stage three but if we can do that if we can do a lot more synthetic work at stage zero stage one to to work out what won't work and that's what's important because you know not only is that a risk downstream but it, you know but it's you know it's, it's that idea to kind of you know model what won't work you know to be able to simulate proteins you know whatever use case you want to use but it's about having that opportunity and, and you know it, it, it consent i mean we we you know as an industry player we, we're happy for a third party to be in the middle of that you know, we're happy for more than one third party to be in the middle of that at the end of the day we, we don't want personal information what we want is yeah. representative data and i've you know i think all the speakers have mentioned that you know you can you can have inequality built in simply because you know a, a certain treatment is only affordable to a certain population but if we don't control people's perceptions if we don't inform people and start this conversation early then we'll bake inequality in because you know a majority of people won't share their data because they think you know i'm i'm, I'm being genetically cloned somewhere <laughs> You know, and I'm being a little bit flippant to, to make the point, but you've got to make people feel that just as they're sharing their location data when they use Google Maps, or just when they're, you know they're sharing their preferences for like, for particular movies, you know, yeah, all of these things can be put together to to learn who you are as a person, but you know, it's it's the greater good, it's the it's the greater good, you know, if if you have limitations on data sharing, you artificially create orphan medicine situations <laughs> you know you are officially create that kind of data limitation you know and so then therefore if 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 we create a scenario where people can it's the default is you don't want to share your data rather than the default being you do want to share your data and you have to remove consent then people have to allow for that synthetic data conversation to to, to be to be reasonably discussed because the only way to, to, to increase that data population is to use synthetic data techniques. And, you know, it's far too detailed to get into today. But all of these things need to be part of that mature discussion. And, and as, 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 a, as an industry, you know, as, as someone here to speak on behalf of industry, we, we you know, we will always work within whatever regulations exist. But, you know, if, if you want to increase the availability of care, if you want to increase the availability of treatment, then these things all speak to increases somewhere. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and hopefully that makes sense. It makes perfectly sense. <laughs> and I think that all we are going to the idea of that we have to work all together to have this education, communication, language, and regulations. But I would like to ask you about you know, the million dollar question. How do we work together? How, how we get to the point to have all stakeholders sit together and work for common regulations, transparency, liability, equality of in silico medicine and digital health? I don't know, maybe Alessandro, do you want to start this question? Oh, yes. Um, well, first of all, I think that uh, patients do want to, to share their data. Um, we have several examples of very active patient community who do want to share their data. And this is the driving force of, um, of data sharing uh, in general. So I, I'm a firm believer that this bottom-up approach is the most uh, pr promising one. Um, then I think we have to create the conditions for uh, data sharing to happen in a safe and equitable way. Um, and we have the instruments to make it happen in that way. And these, these instruments will, uh, I'm sure, in the long run, convince also 
um, patients or that are more reluctant to actually uh, appreciate the, um, the the benefit, the greater benefit, the greater good of data sharing. Uh, these tools are, uh, for example, more granular form of informed consent in which uh, patients can um, exert some form of meaningful control over what is shared and for what purposes um, uh, and under which uh, under which uh, conditions. Um, I think we should not be um, too much worried of the distinction between um, the public and the private sector, meaning that the, the private sector is uh, a valuable uh, component of the data ecosystem and uh, we need to uh, make it possible also for private companies to uh, uh, get access um, in a in a safe and effective way to to health related data. Uh, what I'm not a firm uh, believer in is the model of data ownership. I think data ownership is not the the, the way to go. It will in the long run restrict accessibility um, to data. And also, I think that it um, inadvertently uh, shifts the, the burden, the responsibility from data users to data subjects. And I don't know uh, if data subjects are in, the, in, a, in a position to actually uh, be the broker of their own data. Uh, so in the long run, I don't see the benefit of a model that is based on data ownership by, by data subjects. So uh, to answer your question, I think that we should go bottom up and we should really do the piecemeal work of creating the, the right tools and the right conditions to increase, uh, in general, the public trust in the, uh, in the data ecosystem through which we uh, share our data, our very valuable data for uh, most likely for the greater good of future patients, not for the benefit of ourselves. Okay, Luca. I, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just a very quick comment, um, also let me be uh, provocative also on this, uh, regarding the informed consent. The informed consent, I'm sorry to say it, but it's a very big hypocrisy. Because I think that all of you that have been to a doctor, you've never been through a real explanation, a complete explanation of informed consent and signature of what you were able to understand. And you are young researchers. So... Think about people that is not able to understand at all. So, I mean, uh, we are comparing the digital and the, the dissemination and the consent to data to something that is happening now in a way that, let me say, is not at all uh, acceptable. But it's happening every day, not only in the, in the healthcare, but also bank uh, or, or uh, many other areas where we are seeing signing in two minutes and uh, we don't know what we are signing. So from this point of view, uh, we think that it will make really sense uh, to ask ourselves uh, if uh, going to digital from this point of view, giving opportunity to people to review the informed consent before, to be trained on what they're going through, to see video, to ask questions, to, to, uh, to sorry, to answer a question or to ask a question is maybe a better way than traditional way. So maybe digitalization is not better, it's not worse, sorry, for, for data management, but it's better because the people start to really provide an informed consent that is really informed, first of all, and then there is a consent, because now this is not what's happening. Oh, well. We will move to Josep and then to the, our hand in here in Zoom. I think your question is an excellent question, as always. Huh? <laughs> you know, I will tell you one thing that is very important no? for me. Eh? Patients, it's time is taking care more responsibility of their health. This is clear. I will tell you an example. When I was work, I, I, I got my MD in the hospital Valle de Bron, and when I asked to the patients about, you remember about the surgery? Well, I, I remember I take a bocadillo of calamares, no? But I remember that Dr. Salapatau made the intervention, but I don't know exactly why. It was 35 years ago, and it was a cholestectomy, no? But now, the patients know everything. The patients go to some Google and check it. The problem also in the system is that the doctors, uh, especially with the COVID time, was difficult that the patients go to the doctors. That means that each time, patients is taking more responsibility of their health. This is sure, and will be do it. I'm sure about that. I don't have any question. 
That means in our case, in our, in our case, as we are representative in a way in the world, the patients are in the center, in the center of the disease, but real in the center, not in the, in the future. No, we are in the center. No, we are in the center. And we are creating a cluster, a cluster and uh, a community. And what, what are involved in the community? That involve health authorities, because we are there. I can explain an, an example. We just stop a process in the Ministry of Health that they would like to not reimburse a drugs. And OAFI achieved that, especially for women, that the drugs will be reimbursed. Never happened in Spain. It was the patients that we do it. Pharmaceutical companies, of course, that is very important, because the minister, uh, you know, the minister of, I don't know, of the world, they don't make drugs. I mean, the pharmaceutical companies, very important issue to be there. Huh? And also, uh, you know, universities, huh? you know, different companies, medical associations, nurses, associations, everything will be in, involved and working together in this cluster. I can tell you, it's the only way. In our case, because in the case of osteoarthritis, as I mentioned you before, it's not a glamour disease, we don't have too much treatments available. Analgesics and assays that you can use chronically. Then we need to do it. And now we are doing this cluster here in Barcelona. We are doing this cluster. The companies that are working with us, health authorities, making our congress. We make congresses with patients free. Uh, you know, we make a congress in Barcelona. It was 30 tables, three days. And you go to the doctor, there's nothing we can do with OA. Go to the congress and you will see 30 tables speaking about how can improve the way in the patients. Okay? And this is the way. That means that even it's in the in intelligent, artificial intelligence or silico trials, more or less it's exactly the same. We must work together. And the patients are very active today and will be doing more. That means I recommend, as I mentioned in the beginning, contact to the patients, ask to the patients, because they can help to you. They will be happy that to participate in trials, in the ideas and everything. And also, if necessary, to go to politicians. They go to the politicians, especially before to the vote. It's very useful because you can ask to the politicians, what you can do with patients? And they will see everything. I can support the patients before the election. Later we'll see, no? I think very important, this issue. Thank you, Josep. So I think that we have one question here in Zoom, please. Yes, um, I fully agree that uh, patients should be central. And um, I'm also working for the In Silico World project um, that uh, Professor uh, Vichy-Comte was talking about. Um, we have a work package dealing with communication towards the public and they are going to organize workshops with uh, hospitals and also with uh, organizations working with patients. Um, I'm working for a work, for a pack, work package on education and I prepared um, a survey um, to investigate the educational needs within universities, for instance, and we are also contacting people from industry as well in order to verify um, what are the training needs, what are the barriers that um, people experience, what do we would like to achieve. And we see that both um, physics-based models are needed, as shown uh, during the hands-on sessions. And we also see that there is a, a growing need uh, for artificial intelligence as well, and that it can really support medicine uh, towards patients. So um, I will put a link in the chat, if I'm allowed, to um, people who have been attending this conference in order to fill in a survey, in order to collect intended learning outcomes, so that we will be able to organize courses for students on one hand, but also to retrain professionals on the other hand in the long term on in silico medicine. And to work together in, a, in an appropriate way. Okay, many thanks. Yeah, the key, as you have seen, is work together. So now it's time for us to ask to our audience, do you have any question 
Jérôme Jérôme has one question. I just want to have a drink, but uh, <laughs> but actually, uh, well, I have I have uh, one comment and one question. Uh, the first thing is, uh, so Luca, you were mentioning now uh, models uh, to are, are are good, and you gave the example of the uh, programmable robots in a place where you cannot have medical doctors, etc. I agree, this, this is one view. Uh, but I would like here to, to stretch uh, the concept of context of use a little bit. Because it depends. If you take, for, uh, if you take for example, the e-administration. E-administration is very good. And I'm a, I'm, fair, I'm a fan of e-administration. I don't have to rush into an office during working hours, etc. I can be late at night doing my stuff, etc. But when e-administration removes uh, removes a personal contact in case of problem, in case where the, the, the problem I have to solve doesn't fit into the model that the e-administration has set up, for, for me, everything becomes a nightmare. And as a person working in a different country, uh, you know, a foreigner that works in a different country and even can have shared work contract, etc. I, I really struggled with that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and another example relative to that, but stretching the context of use, no? Just fine to have the robot. But having the robot shouldn't be an excuse for not then having all the set of professionals in case something goes wrong, because nothing is failure proof. And, and there is another, another example of context of use uh, we were discussing uh, recently was people from Park Tully, which is a public hospital here, uh, is if we have models that improve the capacity of, of diagnostic, we'll probably diagnostic faster and more people. So the objective is, of course, to provide a better treatment. But if, we, if hospitals are already collapsed with all the misdiagnosed people and we, with all people who are not diagnosed on time. So imagine if we increase by 20% or by 30% the number of diagnoses under the promise that better healthcare will be provided. It will just be catastrophic. So I think it should so go along uh, a, a proper identification of a change of context of use that the use of model will uh, Will, will impose. And uh, that was a comment, and of course, uh, I'm happy to hear your answer and maybe disagreement. Yeah, no, 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 I totally agree. The, 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 my comment was related to the, the perspective. Mm. So it really depends on uh, when we say we, what we mean by we. We mean the people of Barcelona, we mean the Spanish people, European people, or worldwide people. In Europe, we're saying that we have no war in the last 70 years. Unfortunately, now we have a war near to Europe. But there are other continents where they had Europe, the way they, they have a, sorry, a war some years ago. I mean, also in Europe, we had a war in Bosnia some years ago, but maybe was not so, you say, uh, relevant to, to talk about that uh, in the past. So uh, the, if you consider the millions of, of citizens of the world, the million of citizens don't have hospitals. They don't have physician. So that, that so from the mass point of view of the of the human beings, they don't have the problem of a overcrowded hospital. They have a problem that they don't have the hospital. So that's uh, this reason I said I'm pro provocative because of course we have to rethink our hospital care also because it's really expensive. When we talk about biologics, we have to consider that there are therapy um, gene therapy that. The, the, the country don't pay for the patient, but they exist. But they say, don't, don't pay half a million for that patient. Because the way they are working is to have for a patient 100,000 euro per year. And they cannot anticipate half a million because that, that big, break the budget. Or for the uh, hepatitis, there is, uh, hepatitis, there is the, 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 the therapy, okay? But it's 60,000 euro. And so only if you're in a certain condition, you're going to have it. So there is people that cannot be treated. So when I say we, I refer to the world, for the human being of the world. So from this point of view, 
um, the, the, the point is that this kind of technology can help more than create a, a problem from, from the numbers. Then I totally agree with you that if you take away the, the person and you just, uh, you're not able to talk with anyone, there is e-health, pure e-health without a doctor, then this becomes a nightmare. But it's worse if you don't have anything, like most of the people is, is not having something now, if you think about India, China, Africa, where we have billions of people. But let me say, so I agree with you, at a global scale, there is another perspective that I would like to put it out. The reason I was making this comment is that uh, very often people present, and we've seen that in some presentations, people present in silico technologies uh, as uh, cheapest, cheaper solution. Uh, so I agree for the development within a company, et cetera, but at the system level. So uh, I think this might be an unethical promise. To, 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 uh, to say to the system, you will save money on the healthcare system if uh, thanks to the digital solution. It might not be true. I, I, sorry, a very quick last comment, I won't take my time off of the other colleagues, is that we have also considered that there are, in front of the request, less and less physicians. The number of physicians available are decreasing. So the problem is that you have to provide more outcome with less people. And so you have to get this efficiency. So it's not a matter of uh, you save money, but maybe you are able to do something that otherwise you're not able to do. Because uh, if you have uh, X-ray, a lot of X-ray, you don't have the people able to look at them. You need to use the software because otherwise the, the people doing that is not so much trained. They are too young and they make too much error. Or there is no people at all. So unfortunately, the future in terms of uh, healthcare is really uh, problematic because it's starting to cost a lot. Everyone is becoming chronic. More people need therapies. We were talking about osteoarthritis that uh, is, is increasing because uh, there is more people that is uh, not 10 years old that don't have osteoarthritis usually. And uh, that's become a problem how to treat them. To your question, that is good. Um, I, I think it's, it's important take in mind that, for example, uh, each time the European, the European Agency of Drugs or the FDA they approve less drugs, a lot of less drugs. Why? Because the cost of the clinical trials, it's incredible, incredible. I mean, uh, sometimes you need uh, thousands of patients in the clinical trials, no? You remember some years ago, in a phase three, in phase three clinical trials, you need 600 patients, 1,000 patients now, maybe 10, 12,000. That means that each time there are less and less companies that they can approve as a drug. I think one of the the challenge of the, intelli intelligent, the artificial intelligence is try to have, it is very complicated in my opinion, the same results, that means you can recommend something with the less cost. Because the problem that there are now is that sometimes you see drugs that could be, be useful, huh? but they don't have money to make the research. And happen in the end is that sometimes patients they don't have the possibilities to receive or to, to be treated by a drugs because the cost of the clinical test is incredible. That means that the, I think this is one point that we must consider also. No? For example, I will tell you an example uh, that with the patients involved can help. For example, we see, uh, with I refer my experience, no? we see in the women there are 30% there of women with, you know, atrocities, you know, of the, of the main, no? uh, you know, uh, severi with a lot of severity, no? And it's nothing that, that, the mon that treatment available is nothing there, no? And we see by a serendipitia, eh? serendipitia is casualty, we see that the, the women, they take some product by the asthma, they improve, you know, the erosive arthritis of the hands. Normally, if a pharmaceutical company goes to health authorities, they ask for a lot of trials and a lot of things, no? We, the patients, go there, and the health authorities permit to us to make a clinical trial with 200 patients, 150 placebo and 150 with the, the treatment. Why? Because the patients say, please help to us, because we don't have treatment available with eros erosive hands, of the erosive or strategic hands, no? That means that I think this is a very important issue to take care, no?
And I hope, I hope that, that these tools you know, that we speak today could be, you know, a good succeed. And uh, that I think always happens, you no, know, is that could be improve a lot the, the quality of life for our patients, you no, know, I hope. And I am sure that will be uh, very positive, you no, know? I'm sure about that. There's there's a phenomena that's emerging, and Luca gave me the the pointer here with you know the, the, the clinical the clinical base is shrinking. Ten years ago, twenty years ago, if you were making a medical device, you know you it would start off in the clinical space. The idea for it would start off with a surgeon or you know some other some other practicing clinician, and they would one or two or three of them would stay involved with the development of that device if, if it, you know, reached the point of, you know, passing all the clinical trials. And they would expect, you know, some kind of uh, payment, you know, an ethical payment at the end of that process, you know, being a co-developer or co-designer. But once that device was released for production and, and sale, they would go back into their clinical role. What's starting to emerge is clinicians are, are getting into the software business and they're not going back into the clinical world. <laughs> they're, they're, no, they're forming startups. They're, 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 they're claiming, you know, they're, they, there's, there's clinicians who can actually, prog they have programming skills. They have pretty decent programming skills. I mean, you know, I, I've been involved with a few cases from a due diligence perspective, you know, without naming, you know, any, any, any individuals or any companies. Th these guys have stood up a whole digital stack. And the motivation... You know, depending on how that business progresses, you know, are they going to step back and, and stay in the clinical world? Uh, that's 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 a challenge. That's a, that's a that's a challenge. So, you know, if if that's a digital problem, you have to find a digital solution. <laughs> okay, maybe it's time to go to have some drinks. Or there's any question, or would you rather to ask the question with some drinks? Yeah, go to for some drinks. Okay, so many thanks to everybody, and sorry for the late. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for this very nice uh, discussion roundtable that have raised a lot of very interesting points. This closes the VPH Schumer School, and uh, yeah. We'll continue with the drinks. <laughs>